This is a V-Cup first. We're coming to you from Scotland. We're coming to you from inside the Scottish Highlands, inside to Martin Distillery, and inside, inside, <laughs> a match time. I'll see you in a second. <laughs> No sound, now there's sound. Now there's sound, now everybody can hear. Let's start that again from the top. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we've got a technician just off screen helping us out here. Hello, whiskey folk. Welcome, welcome to the V Pub. <laughs> I need to say that all over again. <laughs> I'll probably say it better this time. It is a wee bit different tonight. It's a different thing. We are coming to you live on location, which is why there will be inevitable um, technical issues tonight. However, um, we are coming to you live, as, as I say, from the Scottish Highlands, from inside to Matin, literally from inside a mash tun. We yeah. are actually in a mash tun. I'm sitting here with uh, Scott Adamson, who you all uh, know very, very well from previous streams that we've done together. Anything to Matin flavoured and other things, actually, you've, mm -hmm. you've been happy to step up and get involved in the V-Pub as well. But this is the first time we've done this remotely. And it made perfect sense as to cover why we're at Tamatin to do this before I jump in uh, to the chat and welcome some of you folk here in the lounge. Scott was the first guy to ever step up and be brave enough to come on to the YouTube scene. And that was a Scotch Test Dummies live stream way back in 2017. Scott Fraser yeah. and yourself. Yeah. Okay, very, very risky thing to do in a maverick scene back then in 2017. Yeah. But we're yeah. grateful that you did. I know, we were talking about it a little bit earlier on and I don't ever remember it being something that we thought was risky. It was just, we'd had the chat back and forth with the Scotch Test Dummies and there was no um, there was no thought of not doing it. Uh -huh. and then, uh, just kind of rolled on and I think everyone's seen over the last couple of years what Whiskey YouTube has become. And yes. so it's great to be able to host you for your first on location V Pub here in Tamatan. Well it is it is a bit of a kind of it is a bit of a, a new thing and it's fantastic that we've been able to do it. But it it, it was obvious for me to choose Tamatan to do this, to reach out to you. Because I knew you would you would be accommodating, I knew you'd be up for it, I knew you'd be excited about it. But from that Scotch Test Dummy stream, you then went on to be um, the first channel to come onto my VPUB. Right. You were the yeah. first uh, industry ambassador to step forward and do a, a segment with me. And we covered some crunchy topics, it was, it was some good. controversial it was things, good. right? We talked about casks and we talked about non each statement. We talked about chill filtration and color and everything. Um, and nothing was off off limits you were happy to talk about everything which was amazing same yeah. tonight, as we're going right, fantastic to fantastic and then he was the first remember the collaboration we got together to realize last year's lockdown yeah. festival and we were able to bring the first of our kind of okay it was a bit of kind of spit and sawdust and patched <laughs> together but we made it work and yeah. all those everybody came together to do the first virtual festival again that was driven by by you yeah. 
And then the first uh, corporate channel to invite Maverick YouTubers <laughs> onto there. So it makes sense that it should be the first one that we try a roving VPUB from, from and all its technical uh, challenges and everything. Let's jump in and welcome a few dedicated uh, uh, with, uh, barflies and beautiful whiskey folk quickly first. Let's see if you catch this up. Is it working okay? Are we okay? Whiskey Rev in the background seems to be okay. Fantastic. Who do we have in this evening? Gerben Blocker is here. Good to see you. Gerben, always good to welcome you in. Uh, Annie Tiger is here. Seen that lovely live from a distillery. Yes, it's just about working. This is very glitchy tonight, isn't it? But I've missed two super chats, so I don't want to miss that. Um, I just want to grab these virtual drums that's come, come in from somewhere. It actually looks like Gerben the first. No, it's Bill Monteith. Fantastic, Bill. He's saying cheers, Ryan. Cheers to the gang at Tomatin. Super excited to taste the French collection, interestingly enough, um, and recently showed up on my doorstep. I think we're going to touch that. I've not tried it at all, Bill, but we will be trying it this evening, I'm sure. And Jimmy Legacy, and I bought my Tomatins because of you, Scott. I appreciate bravery with my whiskey. Thank you very, very much, Jimmy Leg. Thanks, Absolutely. Jimmy. Um, I'm going to raise a wee glass, actually, of a... Uh, a bit of a legendary whiskey and whiskey YouTube scene because it's the Tomatin Legacy. Yep. And it seems to have a wee medal around it. What's that about? Aye, so uh, when we win these awards, um, we get given a little medal for it. And so all these bottles have come from the visitor centre where we have them on display as well as pouring. And I believe that was a gold medal at San Francisco World Spirits competition. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've talked about it a lot. Is yep. You don't have to spend a huge amount of money to get a really nice, drinkable, enjoyable complex interesting whiskey i jokingly said to scott before we went live is we'd, we'd poured this so that we could sip as we were setting up and i said it's one of your best products and i didn't mean to suggest that it was better than anything else but it's such a strong performer for its price point if you if you don't believe me look at the blind live challenge that i did in December of 2019, where it performed very, very strongly. The first ever Aquavite Blind Challenge I did with No Ransom's Whiskey, he, it performed very, very well as well, up, up against some really quite uh, considerable competition. I love this because the youth of the spirit is still intact there. It's mm -hmm. still playing, it's still got a voice. Um, there's some nice ex bourbon cast. There is some virgin oak in there, but I think it's been, I don't know how much virgin oak is so here. It's only 15%. Um, so what we're doing here, 85% of the whiskey that goes into Legacy is fully matured in bourbon barrels for about six years, and the final 15% in virgin North American oak for about four years. Um, so it's by no means to be the virgin oak at the fore and yep. overly oaky. It's just had a little bit more depth to what is undeniably a younger whiskey, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but as you say, that spirit is still leading the dance. Absolutely. And I think the crucial thing here is, is that the restraint use of the virgin oak means that it is a Scotch whiskey first and foremost, which doesn't always do very well. I mean, it can still be a fantastic liquid, I think, if, if there is some virgin oak in there for people who love those flavours, those oak-driven flavours. But Scotch whiskey is better if when, the, when cask and oak is used with a wee bit of restraint, I think, uh, to let the spirit's voice come through. And that's what's here. It's just sometimes you can buy this less than 30 pounds uh -huh. in the UK. And I think that that's true across the rest of Europe as well. Precarious Davis in two, fantastic James Morgan, Luna Aaron, Hells Wed, Service Alafis in Norway, Welsh, your, uh, Welsh Toro is in two, saying it's young, absolutely is young. What's the average age of this? Uh, so probably looking at five, five and a half years average Aye. age. Okay, so absolutely it is. You just look at the VPUB that we talked about, Young Whiskey, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and just kind of exposing that idea that what is it that we're actually afraid of? If new distilleries can come along and release product at three years old, if World Whiskies can come out at three years old, if American Whiskies can be three years old, well, we should be able to interact with Scotch Whiskies at a young age too. Um, and the legacy, I think, as the blind challenges have proven, yeah. doesn't always taste like a five-year-old whiskey, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, in this glass right right now, it does not. I think it, that's an interesting thing as well. You know, this is a, the blind challenge, challenges have shown that it holds up well in a nose even tasting, but absolutely. ultimately this is designed to be drunk. Um, not not whiskey, a yeah. nose analytical whiskey, it's a drinking whiskey, it's a sipping whiskey. 
put it on ice, add water, add soda, make a cocktail. It's a very versatile whiskey for that as well. Drink it, drain it, replace it with another. That, it. that, exactly that. And I think it does that very, very well. It's a staple. Anybody that comes around uh, uh, to to my place will know that there's a Tomatin Legacy on hand and it is there for that very thing for relaxed drinking. It's nice to have a dram from time to time where you're not having anxiety <laughs> from the level in the bottle <laughs> going down because it's going to be easy for you uh, to replace. But anyway, let's give you a, a wee map of how we're going to try and, and run things tonight. We want to give you a vicarious look behind the curtain here. We want to give you a wee look see around the distillery. There's still some daylight outside, so we're hoping we're going to be able to catch a glimpse of outside. We're going to then move into the the, uh, the mash room, and then we're going to move into the, the still house, then we're going to move into the cooperage and the warehouse, and kind of take you through those five points of the distillery. Scott is going to attempt to do that by dialing in uh, live. Fingers crossed we can make that work. Um, in between times, I'll be able to hang out with you guys and chat uh, and interact with you as much as I possibly can. Take questions and things for Scott, whatever it may be, um, and just uh, try and kind of get our um, get our hands dirty a little bit with Tomat and use the time that we've got here to understand what makes it tick a wee bit more. Can I make a confession? Can I be brutal? Go for it. Tomatin's not an attractive distillery. <laughs> Nobody's going to drive up here and think, wow, it's such a lovely yeah. place. It is very much a geek's haven. Uh -huh. If you want to know what whiskey is about, the industrialization of post-war whiskey, the growth, the boom, and, and then the 70s, the scale that everything had to get to yeah. to accommodate that boom, and then that sudden crash and dive in the 1980s. Wow. Yeah. You, you reflect that. 100%. And I think, you know, when we're going through tonight, of course, we'll be talking about production. We know everyone more watching enjoys that conversation but I'm a historian in my background and I find the history of tomato fascinating because essentially what it does is it tells the story of the whiskey industry from 1897 to the yep. modern day. Tip for that, it is bang on at every point um, and there's a lot of that to cover as we're going around but I think what I love about it is you know you come up and you see it and we've all got our own way of talking about it here. Some people call it industrial chic some call it a distillery only a mother could love. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like to often say that we're a little bit like the Wizard of Oz here. You know, you pull back the curtain and it's not all song and yes. dance. Um, but on the other hand, you still have all of those kind of tenets of craft and tradition and history. And we've been speaking to Steve just beforehand. The match, but yeah. you, you know the love that these guys have for this place, despite what it looks like. And it's because of the well, liquid. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's one of the nicest things you can do if you ever do visit distilleries. It's nice to go and visit the Edra Dells and the Glen Goynes, the, the kind of cottage style or old school style distilleries that are attractive. Go and see Strathyla if you want a pretty picture. But then go to see the really small scale ones like the likes of Ballandala. Go and see the huge cathedrals like McAllen. And then go and see the ones like this that have been producing continuously for years and bears battle scars of every event across the years. Yeah, and you can see where there's waste ground, where there was once a building. You can see old buildings. You can see the black, um, you know, uh, what's, it, what's the fungus called again? Uh, the oh, name is... Yes. Oh my goodness, it's in Menno's quiz tonight, I'll bet you as well. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the walls are black with growth. Everywhere. I think the fact that we're in a redundant mashtub. <laughs> that's Pairs, a scam yeah. in and of we, we should point out that it is absolutely a redundant mashtub. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's here purely as a tour piece now, isn't it? That's it's, right. Yeah. I mean, this was, uh, I mentioned before, I had the first louter tongue in the whiskey industry. We'll talk about that when we get to the mash house. But yeah. um, in the 1970s, we were running 78 mashes a week. And it's impossible to do that with just one mash tun. So yes, we had a second one. And then as we brought production back down. The new one got kept and the old one got um, discontinued, but it's right in the middle of the site. So unless you want a big chasm of a room and a lot of hard work getting this out of here, it makes sense to cut a hole in the side and let people come Let in people see it and walk inside it. Absolutely, it's fantastic. So this is absolutely in situ. This is where it's always been, and it was once running here. In fact, the hoppers and everything still. Are, are still in situ above it as well, I noticed. Fantastic. So it's that idea that you come to Tomatin and you really do see warts and all. Yep. This is actually a large scale distillery that has not really been built in any way to accommodate tours or visitors and things. It's changed in recent years. We've got a visitor center and everything in place now. And I know you're expanding tasting rooms and experiences and things like that. 
uh, and we'll see some of that, I guess, as we go around. But it is, it's one of those distilleries that you come to and you realise immediately that it's here for a very functional purpose, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. So, we're, as I say, we're, you're going to head outside and hopefully catch some of the, 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 the sunset. The sunset, if there's, it is, it's still uh, 10 o'clock, yeah, it'll yeah. still be there. Yeah. Um, and then go around those points, and in between times, I'll hang out with the folk here, and then we can come back and hang out together and try some of these amazing whiskies. Yeah. yeah. Do you know you set a precedent on the V Pub when you came on and I asked you what you were drinking, and you were drinking an Aaron, I believe it was. That's right, yeah. First ever time. Yeah. So every brand ambassador, industry representative, whoever it may be that's come on a VPUB since, has been drinking something that's not in the, of their Good. own portfolio. Good. But we, that doesn't need to be the case tonight. No, no. You can't, you can, I didn't even bring a sample with me here tonight. It would be like taking rice to China. So <laughs> I, I have absolutely, um, I'm looking forward to, to sipping through some of the things. Yeah. And apart from the legacy, and maybe one of the peated ones a bit later, they're all going to be new to me too. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we set that precedent because I think, that, again, what we want to do when we come on to shows like this is reveal things that people don't always see. And when we're at whiskey shows or when we're at bars, we're drinking other people's stuff. That's you right. Know? We're That's doing right. bottle swaps. Yeah. So let's see if other people drink. And, and what, what that, what that, the reason I think that you um, are, are, for me, so compelling at what you do in your job is because, first and foremost, you come across as a whiskey geek. You're an impassioned enthusiast. And from the first time that we ever had a conversation, that came across. And I think that helps a lot because when, when you do have to go off piste or when you have to talk about concepts that don't exist in your own portfolio, yeah. you're very comfortable doing that as well, which I think is, is a real asset. Thank you. Um, blush. Yeah. <laughs> I've done the tour at Tomatin before as well, but it was you that, that, that took us around the last time when the Scotch Test Dummies were here, we did the Tomatin tour. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be interesting to watch it and they try and bring as much of that vicariously to the folk that are tuning in tonight yeah. as possible. We're going to try and make it work technically and we're going to try and get through it. If you do get through it with us tonight, thank you very, very much. I will be leaving, for anybody that's watched it on the replay, I will be leaving timestamps down below so that you can click and skip ahead to the, the parts that interest you, of course, like I always try to do. And the, for those of the that are able to stay to the end, we do have a Menno quiz. Menno is hosting the quiz as well. So I will be participating along with you. I'll be taking a holiday, but that brings with it pressure, as you know. I'm looking forward to it just as much as you are, probably. Shall I let you go then? Perfect. And get your retour on, and I'll scooch into the centre of the screen here and try and hang out with the... Uh, I'll see you on the other side, big see guy. Good luck. <laughs> I'll hang out with... The beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated bar flies. Wonderful stuff. What a privilege to be here. It's really, really tremendous. I hope I've not been missing too much. Um, I try to bring up, remove that so that I can hear Scott when he comes in remotely. And when he gets to his location, hopefully I'll see him there and I'll be able to bring him in. In the meantime, let's see what you guys are saying. It's quite a big deal that we're actually here and trying to make this work. Uh, Scott's audio is not as clear as yours for me. We need to bring him a wee bit nearer to the mic. I think, Jimmy, I think that's probably what the problem is. Um, aye, we'll just try and get him a bit nearer to the mic next time. Hopefully that will work. The Whiskey Weekend drum, Harrow is saying, oops, just as it jumped, sorry, Harrow. Uh, he's saying the tour in 2019 was great. It's uh, so good to see it again today, tonight. Fantastic, you, Harrow, you've already been here. So it's going to be nice for a lot of folk out there that don't, I guess, normally get to tour distilleries um, because you will be able to, hopefully, I can pick up questions and things and you can ask questions at certain points around. So Scott will be coming into us from the scene outside um, and, and, and talk about, uh, you know, the general site and things like that and perhaps the water source and things. And then in between times, move around, I'll be able to hang out with you. And then he moves along to the mash and fermentation section of the, of the distillery, through to the still house, through the cooperage, and finishing, hopefully, fingers crossed, in the warehouse. Fantastic stuff. Anyway, uh, Bill, I'll raise a, a wee glass and say thanks for your virtual dram. And uh, to Jimmy Leg as well. Cheers, guys. Nice to have you all in. Of course, I'm a wee bit out of sorts tonight because... I'm not in front of my usual setup. I'm not in my comfy chair. I'm <laughs> but it is very cool to be inside a mash tun, inside a distillery. Quite amazing. 
Uh, so if you're trying to get a hold of my attention, you know the drill. Type Aquaviti or at Aquaviti. Roy says, Thomas Selmer, do you know if Tomatin uses a unique yeast strain? Perfect question, Tom, to ask uh, when we get across to the fermentation room, of course, which will come in at the second segment. Um, so we'll, we, we can certainly ask that. Um, yeast. Um, yeah, it'd be good to know what, what type of yeast to use. I've actually tipped yeast into the washback at, 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 at Tomato on a previous tour. Hoyt Temple is saying cheers. Thanks for doing this on-site VPUB. Hoyt, it's fantastic to welcome you, my friend. Hey, I hope it's coming across okay at your side. Um, there's an inevitability that we will be managing some issues, but uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, no one has ever looked... Uh, <laughs> more comfortable in a mash than says Jimmy Leg. And Lucas is in saying uh, Aquavite, really nice background you got there. Uh, this is really the full, what we've got on display is the full rake uh, system here. And as Scott said, the first ever um, full louter mash tun that was ever installed in Scotland. So to have a section here just behind this desk cut away so that you can see it on your tour and literally be encouraged to mind your head but step inside and walk around inside it and you can see the floor you can see the perforated plates in the floor and you can get a much uh, clearer sense of how a, a mash tun is actually going to be extracting all of uh, those really valuable sugars and things out of uh, out of the barley. Uh, Steve Atkins is in, good to have you Steve. Roy you are sleeping in the mash tun tonight, I, I would um, I have to be careful because there's such a selection of whiskies in front of me, Steve. <laughs> that may indeed be a risk. Uh, Mark Slinger is saying, Roy, are you part of the tour now? If there's a tour coming through right now, Mark, I am very much a fixture here and part of the, the tour. Absolutely. Uh, Silic Bang is saying, I'm off to there next week. Uh, is this going to ruin my tour? Well, I don't know. It's up to you. Um, I think that probably... Um, Probably you're going to get some insight and perspectives from Scott from his kind of historian uh, interest in things. I would imagine that Scott is more likely to go uh, a bit more off-piste than the standard tour, but I'm not very, very sure. He's actually on location now. It looks like he's outside. Uh, I don't know if he can hear me. I need a thumbs up. He can, and he's, it looks like he's good to go. So let's hope that the camera is steady and the mic is going to work okay. Uh, Pete Head is saying, we'll call you Mash Tun Roy from now on. I don't mind that name at all, Pete Head. Good to have you in, Frank. And Hoyt is saying, uh, AV is streaming smoothly. Fingers crossed that that continues. Let's go over to Scott now and see where he's coming into us uh, uh, and see what daylight we have left. Scott, can you hear? I can. Mash Tun Roy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. I'm very relieved to see that that's working, that it's okay. I'm going to go, I'll leave you on full screen. Um, I'll still be able to hear you. You'll still be able to hear me. So if I pick up any interesting questions or whatever, uh, I'll come in throughout. But the screen and the stage is yours, my friend. Tell us where you are. Great stuff. Thank you. I mean, I think the most important thing, the tech's working, which is great, but the midges have died down since we did the little trial. So we can spend even more time out here, which is fantastic because normally when you're in a tour, you're in the distillery, you don't get a huge amount of time outside. And I think it's really important to understand what Tomatin's all about. Um, if you were to come here in, before 1897, really all you would see behind you, behind you is the water, the mountains in the background, and the house up on the hill there. Um, here at Tomatin, we're 315 metres above sea level. And... Um, up until the 1890s, building a functioning distillery here just wasn't feasible because there was no transport links. And that meant that illegal distillation was the rule of the day right through the 1800s, well after the Excise Act. Um, Tomatin itself in Gaelic means hill of the juniper, Tom meaning hill and Atin meaning juniper. And some of you will be thinking juniper, are you talking about gin? Um, the juniper berry is used in the gin production, but the bush itself when you light that on fire, creates an incredibly intense heat, uh, but no visible smoke. So it was the ideal fuel for illicit distillers. And that very much continued uh, through here for a long time. And the house up on the hill there that you maybe can't see because of the trees, uh, that's called the Old Laird's House. And there's a record from uh, 1746 of an illicit still being found in that house. So it just shows you how close we were to the action. But all that changed in 1897. When the Highland Railway line was completed, and Roy, you drove under that today, but we can't see it because of the trees behind us. 
when that was completed in 1897, it meant that manufacturing could viably occur in a place like this, a very remote place. And a local man called John McDougall, who was the merchant, the postmaster, the registrar, justice of the peace. He was the schoolmaster, but he was also the factor of the local estate. So he was right at the forefront of local improvements. The big thing about that was bringing industry and bringing people to the area. And so um, on the 8th of June 1897, he established the Tomat and Spade District Distillery Company Limited. He obtained five acres of land from the McBain family who owned the Tomat and Estate. And crucially, he obtained the exclusive rights to draw water from the Altma Freeth Burn, which since 1897 has remained our water source. So even though the distillery went through massive, massive changes, this water source is what's made every single bottle of Tomatin possible uh, throughout history, which I think is a really, really incredible thing. Um, he also at the time obtained the right to dig peats here which is no longer uh, of so much importance, but maybe when we're talking about Tubok and later on, we'll come back to that. One more thing before we start heading up to the distillery, let's just have a look at some of the, the cottages here, uh, some of the houses on site. So you'll quite often hear me talking about how Tomatin is the last distillery in Scotland to provide housing to the majority of its workforce. Um, over half of the people employed by the company live on site here at the distillery. I'm actually standing where I am right now. I can see my old house that I used to live in for four years here. Um, and that's a great thing because, as I was saying earlier on, you know, it is a big distillery. It's not the most pretty distillery in the world. But all of those tenants of craft and tradition, they're massively, massively important here. And a lot of that goes back to having this housing on site. And it ties really well into legacy, the first dram that we had because when we were coming up with the recipe, it was the people that live on site that had the final say of the cask makeup there. So kind of their dram to you. Um, Roy, I think what we'll do is we'll walk up towards the distillery now um, and kind of continue talking about the history a little bit um, and how things developed, and then we'll get right into production. So I'll grab that, Graham, so we can see. Um, but yeah. Fantastic. In that case, I'll see you at the other side. Now, what we're talking about, what you're talking about there with the name Tomatin being uh, about uh, juniper bushes and, and, and meaning juniper hill, uh, th there's, uh, is there juniper still growing there now? Yes. Yeah. Further, further up uh, on the hill, there's a little bit of juniper growing. Not a huge amount. I think we probably burnt quite a lot of it when we were making whiskey illegally. Uh, so yeah. It's, yeah. it's maybe not quite as... Uh, it's like the buffalo on the plains, you know, it's, it's kind of gone now that we've had our way with it. But uh, yeah, there is still juniper bushes grow indigenously. Has, has Tomatin ever made a gin then? Have they ever just kind of... We've not. We've, we've talked about it. We've got a couple of spills that are not doing anything. Um, and we have talked about it, but um, the, the final decision has never been made. Um, what I'm going to do, Roy, I'm just going to turn the camera around so you can see the distillery as we walk up towards it. Go right ahead. Perfect. So what you'll see in front of me here uh, is warehouse six to hopefully to the left. Um, and then on front of us directly is the malt barns and the malt intake. Um, when the distillery was built in 1897, it was very small. It only had two stills. And the courtyard that we're just about to walk into, there was a train line running into the middle of the courtyard. Um, the original company, we don't have a huge amount of information about it. Um, and we don't know how, how the whiskey was made and how it was run, um, but we know it wasn't successful. By 1906, the company was bankrupt. Uh, but because of the location that we've got here, right next to the railway line, we were saved. You know, a lot of distilleries shut in that early 1900s due to the Pattison crash, but we were very fortunate to be saved by two families from London. Uh, they were the Callinghams and the Saunders. James Saunders produced the exclusive blended whiskey for the House of Lords. He was a whiskey blender. And the Callinghams owned a wine and spirits merchants called Hennekes. And so with those two families, we had a direct route to market. Through the Hennekes, we also had access to a wonderful variety of casks. Um, I believe I showed you the old warehouse book in the past with a lot of those different cask types in it. And, uh, and the distillery was very successful. From 1927, there was Tomatin single malt in bottled form was registered in the 1930s and was available the whole way through. But the big thing was that we kept getting more and more and more 
um, filling contracts. And after the Second World War with the new Excise Act and after barley rationing was lifted in the 1950s, we went through a massive period of investment in not only expansion, but modernization. And that's when we grew from two stills producing around about 220,000 litres of alcohol a year in 1954 to the point that in 1974, we had 23 stills producing 12 and a half million litres of alcohol. The problem was most of that was going to the blended whiskey industry. And when we came into the crash of the 1980s, nobody needed spirit from Tomatin anymore. So we also uh, suffered that downturn and we went into liquidation in 1984. Again, though, we were bought out uh, in 1986 by a company called Takara Schutzo, who still own us to this day. Um, and what's happened since then is we've reduced production size. Uh, we now have 12 stills and we'll see those when we're going around. And we produce about 2 million litres of alcohol a year now, with the focus being our own brands, uh, particularly the single malt brands. But yeah, as you were saying, it, the scale of the site is massive. You can see little remnants of old buildings. Um, so yeah, a, a wonderful place to come and see. Fantastic. And Scott, as well, you talked about getting up to that 12 and a half million litres of alcohol in the 70s. You can hear me, yes? There's a van going past. That's our access to the warehouse coming in. So, <laughs> Fantastic. 12 and a half million litres. What capacity is Tomatin running at today? So if we went at full capacity, if we turned everything on and we worked seven days a week, we could get to around about five million litres. But as it currently stands, we um, start up production on a Monday morning and we finish it about lunchtime on a Friday. Um, we only use 10 of the 12 stills that we have. So that's getting us to around about the 1.8 to 2 million litres of alcohol a year. Okay. And and just to give some contrast, when you talked about the 12.5 million litres, most of it going to blends and yeah. most of Tomatin's history, that being the case. What's the ratio now? How much of this the, the product that Tomatin is making today is meant for single malt under a Tomatin or uh, indeed maybe Kubokan brands? Yeah. So around about half of what we make is sold as single malt by wow. ourselves. Wow. But I think I think what's really interesting is what the other half actually works at. So when it was 12 and a half million litres, what would happen was at the start of the year, the sales guys would go around to all the blenders and they would sign a contract for how much that blender wanted from us every year. Now what we do, though, is we produce that other one million litre. Some of it will go into our blends and the rest of it will be used to trade for the other casks yeah. that we need for oh, our yeah. blends, like Big T and Antiquary. So. We're no longer contract filling in the way we used to. Fantastic. See, before you go on to the next station, before you head into the the, the mash room, I think you're going to the uh, mash yep. and fermentation room next. Uh, maybe you could give us a nice slow pan just to give us a sense of a, a nice throw, slow 360 of where you're standing just now, just to give us a, a, a sense of where you are just now and what that yard, that because that, that's the visitor centre car park you're at right now, right? That's right, yeah. So where I'm at right now, you've got the visitor centre car park behind me. Um, and like I say, the, there used to be a train line into the middle of the courtyard there. Um, you can now see behind me is the still house. And that little peaked um, roof that we see there, that's just where you are in there, Roy. Um, then we have <laughs> the malt bins. So that's where all of our malted barley comes in. And then you pan behind and you've got the monolith mountains behind me. Um, that's where our water source comes from. Um, maybe not the most famous mountain range in Scotland, but if you're standing at Urquhart Castle looking over Loch Ness, those are the mountains you see. I um, don't know how great the image is holding up in the light here, but that, that's the bridge that we just walked up from behind us with the housing. And then we start to pan round uh, the Way Bridge and then Warehouse 6. And there we go, back to the courtyard there. Fantastic, buddy. I look forward to tuning in to you when you're at the mass and fermentation room. Thank you so much. We'll make our way up there now. Cheers. Cheers.
That wee interlude I should have played for you before we went to Scott earlier. I've made little interludes, interludes to give him a cue when he's actually coming in, but I've got it for the rest of them. Fantastic. Jimmy Legg was asking what the rent is on Scott's old house there, and Eric Cunliffe came in with another virtual dram as well and suggested that he would double up whatever uh, Jimmy was going to be paying for the, the rental on it. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks very much for your dram, and thanks, Eric Cunliffe, as well. Cheers to you both. Thank you. Interesting when we talk about uh, Tomatin and we see Tomatin, it's, it's gone from, a, a, I can remember, remember maybe only having maybe a Tomatin 12, uh, a Tomatin 15 year old, that kind of thing. Very limited range available from Tomatin to the point that today 50% of their production is being sold as a single malt for single malt's sake. That's a huge, huge swing. And again, it's another example of how to, Tomatin it seemed to be one of these distilleries in Scotland that kind of follow the ebb and flow of Scotch whisky, the industry generally, and um, that kind of boom and bust thing and the changing a uh, focus and how things adapt in time. The first to have a full louter mash tun, you heard, we'll hear more about that in a wee minute as well. And I think it was also the first distillery to fall under Japanese ownership as well, who've been stewarding it ever since the late eighties. Um, and have invested all of this in order for us to be able to try just so many expressions of tomato today. Tim is in, Donald Pass Whiskey is saying, Aquavita, does that Japanese owner have Japanese whiskey brands name that contain tomato malt? That's an excellent question, Tim, to ask Scott. Uh, I, I am not so sure. So what you're talking about is a, maybe a, a, a something in place, a bit similar to Nika, who own Ben Nevis, that take a lot of the Ben Nevis production straight over to Japan, um, meaning it's hard to get your hands on a Ben Nevis branded product at times. Um, and so much of it is sold uh, outside, uh, sorry, uh, outside of Scotland, but uh, domestically in J Japan and internationally as a Nika product and not as Ben Nevis. I don't know if the same thing happens with Tomatin, but it's an excellent question for Scott. Whiskey Weekend Jam Haro is saying, hey, it poured my last of the tomato 12 sample I got at the tour, Scott, and he's given it a thumbs up. Fantastic, Harrow. I hope you're enjoying it as you sip along with us. We don't have the 12 year old tonight, although we do have a, one of the agitated ones. We have the 14 year old, which is the port cask. Um, we may get a chance to try that a wee bit later. And Graham Fraser is saying, uh, Ben Marnock, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Graham, that just jumped. Sorry. Sorry, I missed it. Jimmy Legg is saying, what do you think the percentage is for other distilleries of the same size? Yeah, I was actually surprised, Jimmy, to hear 50%. That's That sounds a lot to me. I was expecting, you know, 20, 25%, something of that order. The last time I asked that question, interestingly, was back in 2017. Uh, when it was on the Scotch test, when Scott appeared on the Scotch test dummies live, it was the first time I ever got an interactive comment way before I was creating content uh, read out on a YouTube stream. And that was the question I asked, and it was a hell of a lot less. So in the space of just four years, a lot more of the production here at Tomatin has been set aside to be sold as a single malt. And that makes sense, absolute sense, uh, given uh, the growth areas in, in Scotch whiskey. And Tom Elmer is saying, uh, just for fun, is Scott allowed to say how old Kubokin is? Uh, Scott will uh, happily share uh, most of all of that with everyone, I think. I don't think anything is off limits, so I uh, feel very free to ask. In fact, I'll write down here as well, because I know, Tom, you're interested in knowing about the yeast. So Tom Elmer Kubokin ages. I've been involved in Kubokin ages in the past where they've revealed uh, the ages of the spirit inside. Ryan Sutherland is saying, I'd imagine the antiquary, uh, the antiquary eats into uh, remaining uh, 50 a fair bit. That's their own blend. I don't doubt. Now, the, that's not a very popular blend in the UK, but export-wise, I think there's uh, a lot of demand for that product. And Jimmy Legge is saying, is the Rev there with you? I'd love to see his smiling face. Yes, the Rev is indeed with us, and he's actually smiling right now. So there will be an opportunity for the Rev to pop in and say hi, just for you, Jimmy Legg, no doubt at all. Gregor Nightman is saying, I want to go back again to Tomatin. It was there with Dad, who's also watching now. Fantastic, Gregor, and fantastic to welcome Gregor's dad too. I landed whiskey nerd is saying, I landed a single cast claim leash. It is an amazing 10-year-old. Fantastic. I hope you're enjoying it, Rombo, and it's nice to welcome you in here, my friend. And David Owen is saying, Aquavita is still enjoying the Tomato 15 bourbon matured at 46%. That's going to be my question to Scott tonight. When are we going to see more 
refill cask only mature teenage scotch whiskies uh, under the tomato brand under kuboka whatever it may be and um, that's kind of i think it's, it's a kind of a gap that's missing right now there are some that are out there that do that and they do it very well i think we need to see more of it i think every core range needs to have an, a refill cask expression out there callum stewart has just joined uh, the, the aquavita barflies as well uh, callum it's very nice to welcome you in, my friend just for anybody that's interested that's another way to support the, the channel by pressing the join button underneath you get access to lots of little uh, emojis and things like that to have a bit of fun coloring up the chat but more than anything it's just another way to support the channel callum i appreciate it thank you very much my friend cheers to you finishing off my tomatin legacy just in time i think because Scott's poured a little flight for me here. But this flight of whiskies that he's poured is going to be interesting because, as you can see, they're all clear as water. They're not water. They're new make spirits. And I think that these represent various uh, points uh, throughout the tour. So I'll let Scott lead me in. If Scott's ready for the next section of uh, the tour, I think we're going to go home over and, and join our co-host. Um, are you in good shape? Give me thumbs up, Scott, if it's all okay. Fantastic. We'll go over and join Scott at the mash and ferment point of tonight's vicarious demand tour. Welcome to the Mash House here at Mappin. Um, I think one thing that I should start off by saying when we talked about production is that we have actually just begun our summer shutdown. So the 2020-2021 distilling season has come to an end. In fact, what we'll see when we get into the still house later on is the very last drops of spirit that will be coming off the stills before the shutdown. It is the very last run. Um, and that's just kind of happened. It wasn't planned that way for the show, but I think I really good time to come because there'll be not too much noise in the back, hopefully. Um, we're going to talk through production and I've seen a few questions coming in so far, so we'll try and answer as many questions as we can get to us. Uh, but Roy, I think first of all, what I'll do is I'll explain a little bit about what you've got in front of you in terms of the spirit um, and then hopefully explain where some of those flavours are coming from. So from left to right, what you have is the traditional spirit spirit that we make for the vast majority of the year. In the middle, you have our chocolate malt trial that we just completed this week. Um, our first ever chocolate malt trial. We got the, uh, the barley in last week and we've uh, we've now just completed the stilling it. And then finally, you have the two bulk and you make spirits um, at the end. What I'm going to do uh, as I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you Kind of the timings and the uh, temperature that we use to produce the tomato new mix for the traditional new mix, but then kind of touch on here and there where the differences are for the chocolate bomb and for the kubok as well. So um, hopefully that will all come together and make sense. But can you hear and see it's okay? Yeah, well, I mean, I just, I just, just to clarify, and something that's a mistake that I've made in the past, and and you, you, you've, you've spoke about it in the past. These are three completely different new makes. Um, obviously, the, the chocolate malt in the middle is a new thing, but the tomato new make that I have in number one, I have to say, I think new make is something that I, as time goes on, I'm enjoying to smell and taste more and more. I actually enjoy the aromas more than the flavor for, with new make, and, and, and nosing this new make was is, it's amazing. It's in so many ways, it's like the capturing the smells that you smell when you walk around the distillery, almost. Um, but sorry, one of the things I wanted to just pause on a wee bit there, Scott, was the idea that Kuboken is not simply tomatin made with peated malt. It's a completely different regime, correct? That's right, yeah. And, and what we'll do is, where we get to those decision points as we're going through over the next week while, as I'll point out where tomatin and Kuboken differ, just for clarity, 
Um, the chocolate malt went through the exact same process as the traditional mash and spirit. Um, the difference is, and actually a good place to start is with the mash. Um, at the moment, we have a nine ton mash. Uh, on the chocolate malt uh, trial, we did one ton of chocolate and eight tons of our standard uh, concerto barley. The reason for that is that chocolate milk has zero yield. That all the enzymes are dead, so you can't create, you have to create alcohol, but you can create a lot of flavor, and it's really impressive to see just the massive changes in color of the wort and the wash, and then um, the subtle differences in the spirit there. But So tomato and tomato chocolate, same process the whole way through after that difference. Kubal can be quite different in, in many places, but it all starts here in the mash house. Um, in fact, if we pan this to the side there, you can see the mill and the clean stone, all of our um, qualities. See, even on the glasses at the time, and that's a courteous mill, uh, what else would do the job, you know? And then coming to the hopper, that's a massive hopper. And then I think we need to try to keep you as close to that mic as we can, Scott. Okay. Your audio is breaking out. Break, maybe just be for me, of course. But Okay, um, I'll try and talk a bit louder, but hopefully that's okay now. Um, but you can see the hopper here where all the grist is stored before yes. it comes into the mash tun. And what we'll do is we will take that nine tons of grist and we will add 32,000 litres of water at 64.5 degrees centigrade. And that first water will sit for 30 minutes and it will start to uh, cut apart all the starches into fermentable sugars. It will uh, draw out the nutrients that we're going to need for our yeast to survive. And it will also start to pick apart some of the compounds that will create flavor in our final spirit. After that first half hour, we'll open the bottom and we'll start draining what is now our wort through to the tun room. We'll then add our second water which is 14,500 litres of water at around about 79 degrees centigrade. Um, the, the important thing to note here is that that water isn't converting starch into sugar. What that's doing is rinsing the remaining sugars that have lingered on the barley uh, from the first water. And that will also join the second water uh, and go through to become uh, our fermentation, become our wash and become our spirit. The third water is around about uh, 15,000 litres, and that's right up at 90 degrees centigrade. And that's going to strip apart just the final bits of sugar, but what it will also do is pick up quite a lot of the tannins from the barley. So we don't want that directly as part of our wort. So that goes right back up to our good plants. Uh, you might not see because of the light. And that forms part of the first water of the next mash. So very much the, the typical mashing regime that you would find at many distilleries. As we said, at Matt and Gear, we use louder mash tuns. Um, the mash tun that you're in right now, Roy, was the first louder mash tun installed in Scotland in 1960. And the defining feature of that is the rakes on the arm, rather than the turning of the traditional mash tun. It was developed uh, by the German brewing industry to produce a clear wort uh, and as a result, produce a fruitier uh, beer and for us, spirit. Um, it's also much more efficient. And uh, the way it creates that clear work is by having a lower um, lower grain bread bed. So there's not so much uh, grain for the water to come through before it goes through to fermentation. So we're getting the clear wort. And that's a, one of the first points on that new mixed spirit that you're trying is that that's going to help us to create some of those fruitier ester led flavours that you're getting in your new mix spirit there. Um, as we're walking through, do you want to, how, how, how are you finding the new mix spirit? What sort of flavours are coming through for you? Well, I think what's striking is that the new make, I'm, which I'm clearly enjoying, by the way, because it's disappearing. <laughs> um, the new make is very, very kind of um, sugar and boiled sweets. There's lots of confectionery behind sack loads of fruit. It's a very, very fruity thing which is very, very typical of, of kind of new make spirit. If anybody's tried new make before, they'll know that it's often very, very a fruity thing. But where you would be looking for, that there is a wee bit of apple in here and things. The fruit that I'm thinking about is more kind of, uh, I don't know, like starburst type fruits, like, like, a, like a confectionery, 
a slightly strawberry, peachy, sweet dessert type fruits in, in this one. And if you want me to contrast that with the chocolate malt, this is a real surprise because chocolate is a word to describe the roasted malt. And yet there's chocolate here. It, uh, tell me that it's not just by the power of suggestion because there's there's powdered chocolate here, like dried drinking chocolate, that kind of thing, cocoa powder. And there's there's even a creamy nature to it as well. I'm not getting a lot of kind of roast notes, not getting a lot of mocha coffee. Maybe if I sit with it a bit, that'll start to come through. Is that what we should be looking for here? Yeah, so for me, what I found the biggest difference between our traditional Munich and the chocolate malt was that in the chocolate malt, those kind of fruity notes aren't quite as evident. Um, the, the, the fresh sort of sweet orange that I get in the traditional new make, it's gone a little bit bitter in the in the chocolate malt. But then what it really is for me, like you say, that chocolate's there. Um, I think in name and in nature, it's that dark cocoa powder. I do get a little bit of coffee, but I think part of that was when I was here a week ago when the guys were mashing in, it smelled like a coffee roaster's here. And I think I've struggled to really lose that connection with that product and that spirit. So for me, I get almost like a ground coffee after that chocolate's gone. What I find really interesting on the taste is there's more spice. And it's a little bit like um, a chili spice, a uh, pepper spice. And you'll notice on the table beside you there, I've left you a little bar of chocolate, which is chili infused chocolate. So if you want to uh, have a look at that with that spirit, it might be quite a good time to do so. <laughs> Thank you very much. You did indeed. I have to say that well, as soon as you start helping me, as soon as you start suggesting things like the chili, absolutely you pick it up there. You're going to pick up um, chili and chocolate heat and things like that. This might help exaggerate that even more. But what's interesting here is that there is a pop of flavour, a very interesting flavour. I think, are these all cast strength, Scott? These these. Uh, these are uh, still strength, so they're strength, yeah. around about 70, 71 percent. There is a little jug of water on the table in front of you there. It might help to, even if you add that, it might open up more of the differences. Um, but yeah, what they're straight off the still. And certainly the ABV is helping to amp that concept of chilli, absolutely. But the flavour here, and I think that's probably the point, because if you're not getting any alcohol yield from chocolate malt, people might ask you, why would you, why would you, even process why would you malt such a thing and of course that's as you as we're touching upon now it's for that flavor isn't it that's right yeah that's exactly what we're doing and um, it's for nothing more than to see what else we can do you know i think we've gained the reputation over the last 10 maybe even 15 years of being quite forward in cask maturation and experimenting on that side of things but increasingly um, we're looking to production to find out you know that last week of production every year when we've got room for trials, what can we do? Um, Kubalkin was an, a, a trial originally, and now we're looking at the summer shutdown, what can we do there? And we'll be doing different things each year, filling it into different types of casks, but ultimately changing the barrel and changing the yeast and, um, and see what we do there. But that, that brings us on to the, the tongue room, which is almost perfect. Time. Absolutely, and, and Thomas Elmer has been asking actually about yeast. Now, if yep. you say that these are both the same, whether it's the original tomato and malt that we've all come to know and connect with, and this new one, um, there's a lot of people in the in the lounge tonight actually talking about actually keen to get their hands on this. Even even some of them wanting to try it as a new make spirit, not necessarily having to wait the number of years they're going to have to wait before it, be, it hits the market. Um, yep. So, of course, is there any plans for that? And also, Thomas Elmer has been specifically asking about the yeast uh, that you're using. Um, in, in this in, in both of these malts? Well, first of all, there's no plans to release the, the new make. Um, I do think it is an interesting thing because, you know, we get to try it and we get to compare it and that. But ultimately, that's not the final product. We want it to, to shine at the end. However, um, obviously next year when we get back to travelling, I'm going to be going to as many whiskey festivals as possible. And if you <laughs> ask nicely, I might have something tucked under the table for you to try. Um, so at least it lets let some of you get a, get a little sample of it. And Roy, I might let you get away with a sample tonight as well and you can share it amongst some of the community as well. So um, that sounds like well, a Well, I plan. think that was nice because inside Patreon, I did a wee competition because I wanted them to guess where we would be broadcasting from here tonight, whether it was going to be the boardroom, whether it was going to be the warehouse, or whether it was going to be actually inside a mashtun. 
So that would be a very nice giveaway, actually, if I stole a sample from you tonight. That would be a nice thing. But I understand why you're not necessarily going to release it, because there is a nice thing about building up demand for something and releasing it only when it's actually something that's representative of what you envisaged in the first instance. So I understand that completely. So on to Thomas uh, Elmer's, uh, Tom Elmer's uh, yeast yep. question then. Yeah, so um, first thing what will happen is the wort, 42,000 litres of the wort, will come through to the tun room here and it will go <laughs> to one of these open big vessels um, that I'm hoping the phone doesn't drop into. <laughs> but so the wort will go, go in. As a distiller's yeast, it's MG plus. Uh, uh, you need to, it. sorry, Scott, you need to just repeat your last sentence again. You, the, the sound did disappear on you there. So just. Sorry, what, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was saying uh, we had 120 kilos of yeast, um, cake pressed yeast, and it's MG plus. It's a strain from Pinnacle, which is a distiller's yeast, and it's a standard yeast that's starting to be adopted across the industry. Um, it's a yeast that, pro that provides flavours, quite balanced, maybe leaning towards the nutty and fruity elements. Uh, that said, that's what we use for most of our production, but we have in the past for Kubalkan, we've used some red wine yeast and we've used some, um, we've actually used some sake yeast for Kubalkan uh, not too long ago. So hopefully in a few years, you'll start seeing that coming onto the market as Kubalkan spirit. But I think what's really important to talk about here at, in our tun room is the length of fermentation. Um, at Tomatin, we have a week-long fermentation. So from the moment that the yeast is pitched in here, it will be 168 hours before that wash goes through to distillation. That, as far as I'm aware, is the longest, or certainly one of the longest, in the Scotch whisky industry. And like with the chocolate malt thing, you ask yourself why, because Yeast, uh, our distiller's yeast, has done its job after 48 hours. Uh, it's converted all those sugars into alcohol. But along with our distiller's yeast, there are loads of other microorganisms. There's other wild yeasts in the atmosphere, and there's other bacteria. Um, and they will come in with the new batches of barley. They'll be on the plant. And what happens is, over the course of that 168 hours, for the first 48 hours, our distiller's yeast is... The, at the forefront, it's doing all the work, it's getting all the sugar, it's turning it all into alcohol, into carbon dioxide, into heat, and into congeners. But then as that dies off, other microorganisms begin to flourish, and they begin to have their own reactions. And what we're looking for with these long fermentations is what's called a late lactic acid bacteria fermentation. So lactic acid bacteria, as the uh, distiller's yeast dies off, starts to flourish. And it will create a wide variety of things, but the most important things are lactic acid and acetic acid. And with the alcohol, they will form esters. And that's where a lot of our fruit comes from. But what's really interesting is as the yeast uh, from the distillery starts to die, the, uh, the lactic acid bacteria feeds on that, feeds on the lipids and the fats from that yeast. And it creates um, really dense, heavy, fruity flavours like apricot and, as you mentioned, in the new mixed spirit, peach. So that peachy, fruity, uh, tropical flavour that comes across in tomato all happens from that long, long fermentation that we have here. So I think, going back to the question, the yeast that we add is absolutely standard uh, as it is in the industry. But what we allow to happen here is for all the other natural microorganisms to flourish and have their own impact to a degree that I've not really come across anywhere else in Scotland. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and I think what's interesting here, when you were able to try new makes as opposed to a, a finished product that's been matured in a cask, is that we're able to connect with flavours that can take us directly to a point in the process. Um, it's not the finished product, it's not the finished article of that kind of marriage between cask and spirit. But we can, it, it does help us isolate for those of us who are so inclined where the flavour is coming from. Is the flavour coming from the grain? Is the flavour coming from uh, the fermentation? And, and Scott's talking about the length of fermentation and how that develops over time. 
Um, is it coming through, I guess, what we're going to talk about the next section is uh, how fast, slow the distillation has been, what kind of cut points have been taken, what kind of shape the stills are and all of those amazing things, is that this new make spirit lets us kind of take the cask element out and try and fathom and chase the flavours a wee bit down to into specific points in the process. Yeah. Um, I think what we'll do, like, just because of timing, um, I've seen the Evans come on site, what we'll actually do now is we'll run over to the warehouse, we only get that for 20 minutes after uh, the distillery shut from for revenue and customs purpose, so we'll run over there first so you get a look in there and then we'll go back to the still house. I think it's going to be a little bit uh, out of sync, but that's fine. No problem at all. I'll let you run over to the warehouse and take the opportunity because I think that's too good to miss, buddy. I'll see you over there in a second. Perfect. Fantastic. I I think we'd all like to see inside the tomato warehouse. Um, and I know that the warehouse he's going to go to has got some really quite special and spectacular things in it. There are various uh, distillery tours that you can take right across the industry, and some are kind of entry-level, uh, look-see, production-type tours. Other ones are more kind of focused on flavour and tasting and more premium uh, examples and things. I where, where distillery, even if it's just a look inside the warehouse or a warehouse tasting even more so, I'd encourage everybody to premium, uh, to that is the best experience you're going to get at distilleries most of the time. So maybe when Scott's there, we'll ask if there are any tours at Tomatin, maybe not under current restrictions perhaps, eh, that kind of focus on the warehouse if they've got that in place yet, perhaps not. Um, I'll jump back into the lounge quickly and eh, try and eh, <laughs> the guys are passing through and stealing beer <laughs> from, from the table as they go. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I'll jump back into the lounge and uh, hang out with you guys for a wee minute while they're making their way over the warehouse. Bud Jenkins is here saying, good to have you, Bud. He's saying that description from Scott on the long fermentation was the best I've ever heard. It really connected with the process, with the flavours, absolutely. And it's that idea where you get someone like Scott who's going to kind of geek out on his own personal time, not just when he's on the clock at Tomatin. And I think that's kind of what I enjoy with a Scott Adamson and his peers in the industry that's exactly like him. Tommy Elmer is saying awesome stuff, great description of the process, thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Time for a dram. Gregor is in as well. Roy, making Scott work. It's like Challenge Annika, the whiskey edition. It is a wee bit like that, but we'll not have no camera chasing shots. I hope, Gregor, good to have you in, buddy. I hope you're doing well. But again, it's Dave is here too. Good to have you in, Dave. Luna Aaron, Lee J. Brown. Uh, fantastic to have you all hanging out with us. This is a treat tonight because, you know, there are new makes out there that you can taste from here and there. Um, but what's nice is to be able to take the same new make from the same distillery and contrast and compare when there's no other variables in play, like cask, what kind of cask, how active was the cask, you know, how long was it in the cask, that kind of thing. This is a much purer and much more direct comparison. And I am honestly very, very, and this is super fruity, all that kind of starburst fruits that he's talking about, the peach and the orange that Scott was talking about. There is a very sweet orange, almost like a mandarin um, satsuma type sweet. Not here, but it's, it's a sugary sweetness. This is a sweet fruit. And this one is kind of, it's much richer. It's a slightly darker experience. And I know that it's roasted malt, chocolate malt, so immediately the suggestion there is that it would be darker, but it, the flavour is a darker thing. It's a lot more aromatic, a lot more heady, a lot more chewy even. And the fruit is still a wee bit sweet and fruity, but it's dialed right back. It's richer flavours that are coming coming to the to the front on this one and it's a long finish a chilly finish that scott is talking about is definitely there but again we're sipping something that's at, at full strength so it's way up close to nudging 70 percent abv i can see that the boys are heading off to the warehouse i don't know if they're ready for us yet but i am keen to have a wee look inside a uh, tomatin's warehouse uh, i won't get a chance to do that this trip but i have been in there before <laughs> and being able to have a, a nice time hanging out there. Are you good, Scott? Give me a wee thumb if you are good, absolutely. Let's head over eh, to the warehouses at Tomatin and see what we can hear from Scott.
Alex Scott, you're supposed to be there, buddy. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> Come back to me answering questions. <laughs> well, we're in warehouse six. As I said, if we were going on a standard tour, this would be the very last point of the tour. But I think um, because we're out of working hours, we've had to get special permission to come in to the warehouse uh, at this late hour. And uh, Evan, our uh, facilities manager here, our site manager, has very kindly come in and opened the door for us. Actually, a little story that I love and I think it brings together Tomatin quite well. Evan's worked at Tomatin his full career, I think nearly 40 years. Um, and his dad worked here before him. And in this little office that you see to the side here, the little excise man's office as it used to be, there's a little piece of graffiti on one of the walls there, a tiny little piece. And it was written by Evan's dad when he was 15 years old. And I think, you know, again, <laughs> just that point, this is a distillery with families and generations of the same people working here. Um, but yeah, at Tamatin, we've got 13 warehouses. Um, so two of them are Dunnage, like this one here, like Warehouse 6. The other 11 are racked warehouses, like you saw in the little clip there, the big racked warehouses. Um, but warehouse and we, we, talk about, we talk about Dunnage quite a lot, and we use that term quite loosely, Scott. It's a throwaway term. Even we use it as a, a nosing and tasting note as well, Dunnage. So just explain, we understand the racked warehouse would be where the casks are racked and stacked high, but yeah. Dunnage is, is something quite specific. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll actually take this camera here in just a moment, and you can see behind me we've got the three stores of casks. That's as high as you would ever go in a Dunnage warehouse because... After that, everything is one cask high. It earth down. It is earth. It is turf. You might not see it so well with the light, um, and it's stone walls um, that you can see there as well. So that is a Dunnage warehouse where the casks are racked one, maybe two, three at the most high. Uh, earthen floors, thick walls. And these are the really traditional warehouses here in Scotland. And as you say, Roy, I think increasingly Dunnage has become a tasting note, particularly for older, more oxidised whiskies. And even for, um, sometimes I find it in whiskies that have that old bottle effect that has that little bit of that minerality that you get in a Dunnage warehouse. I've often tried to explain to people what a Dunnage warehouse smells like, and particularly this one, without ever taking the minute. And all I've ever been able to sum it up as is like taking a can of pineapple chunks into a secondhand bookshop. It's that mix of damp and earthy, leathery notes with big bursts of fruit. And I think that's as close as I've gotten to it. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that's probably the closest I've ever heard. It's really, really difficult to articulate that note. What you need to be able to do is step into a Dunnage warehouse and the smell and the aromas hit you immediately as soon as you walk in. They're very heady. They're very reminiscent of earth and dank and musty. We, the Scots word that we use is fusty quite regularly. But this wonderful kind of inviting kind of fruit and, and everything is just almost too stale but not quite. And still, once, once, but once you get that in your head, and once you, once it's fixed in your olfactory system, you'll never forget it, and you will pick it up. Whether it's old whiskies that have been aged in glass for a long time, Scott, absolutely, or indeed fairly mature whiskies that like that are sitting over your shoulder right now. So, which think, just which warehouse are you standing in right now? So I'm in warehouse six right now, and warehouse six is uh, it's it's kind of the beating heart of Tamatin. It is the the soul, it's right in the centre of the ground. It's the oldest building on site. It's been here since 1897. Um, and some of you all know that we've released the Warehouse 6 collection. So uh, we have around about 176,000 casks on site at Tamatin. And wow. less than 1,000 of them are in this building. So this is really, really a small part of that whole collection. And what happens is... Over the years, distillery managers or blenders, as they've uh, been placing parcels, when they find something that is particularly unique or outstanding, it gets moved to warehouse six. The rate of evaporation is lower here. Um, it, it allows for a much longer, slower maturation. And it means that we can really keep those whiskies and allow them to flourish. In addition to that as well, 
Um, this is where we'll store things like tawny port pipes or odd sized cherry uh, butts and puncheons because we don't have space for those in the racked warehouses. The racks aren't designed to hold those. So some of those weirder styles of casks that we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to the cooperage, um, they're stored here. And so the Warehouse 6 collection celebrates that and it's um, a celebration of all those wonderful things. But what's really cool is the wall behind me here is a cask of every vintage that we have. Wow. You can see the cask that we have at the distillery here is 1967. Wow. So yeah, this is um, one from every year that we have. It's very funny, you get some people coming in who are a little bit younger than myself and get their photo taken next to the cask of the, their year of birth. You get people that have uh, been married in a certain year. I actually had one lady come in and get her photo taken next to the cask of the year that she got divorced. Um, so that was pretty <laughs> interesting. Um, but I think, you know, this is a great point to touch on a whiskey that you've got in front of you there, Roy, which is decades. And uh, feel free to have a dram of that now or not. But I think what I'd like to touch on is the fact that that whiskey... Yeah, I do uh, have it here. There seems to be a medallion hanging from this one as well, Scott. You, you're, yeah. We're doing well. You've got, We're doing well. <laughs> a, a little bird once told me, and it, there's either this is either true or false. Did you have a hand in this creation of this whiskey? I was very lucky to, yeah. So... This was a whiskey. So the Decades concept, for anyone that's not familiar, back in 2011, our master distiller, uh, Dougie Campbell, was celebrating his 50th year of having worked at Tomatin Distillery. And we asked him to create a whiskey to celebrate that. And so he picked casks from each of the five decades that he worked at Tomatin and vatted them together. And in doing so, kind of pioneered this concept of multi-vintage vattings. Um, and made a really tremendously special whiskey. In 2019, uh, his successor, Graham Munson, was promoted from distillery manager to master distiller, and we asked him to do something similar and create his own version of Decades. And luckily for me, my role is I'm global brand ambassador here at Matin, but I've also been very fortunate over the last couple of years to kind of shadow Graham Munson a lot, work in cask selection, work in blending, and I was able to kind of follow him through the process of making decades. And you'll see in there, Roy, it's on the box, which I think is under the table. I can tell you there's whiskey in there from 1973, 1975, 1977, 1988, 1995, uh, 2000, 2009 and 2013. Um, wow. And it's by, no means, it's by no means a seven year old with a teaspoon. A quarter of the liquid is from 1970s. Over 60% is over 25 years old. Um, but my favourite part about all of this was when we tried the samples, Graham had tried the individual casks and we've added them together and it was perfect. But by the time we'd actually tipped all of the casks that we were going to use, the uh, the palate was a little bit bitter. There was a, an astringency. The, the nose was perfect, but there was a bit of an astringency and I was sitting with Graham and I said, what are we going to do about this? And he said, go and get three more from 1995 and two more from 1977. Uh, so he identified that the bitterness came from the Verdeo casks from 2000 and 2009 and just decided to add some more 40-year-old and some more 25-year-old to help balance that out. And that's how you've got the wonderful whiskey that is on front of you right now. I'll say to you, Scott, I have this. A, a very kind gentleman gifted me this. Uh, once upon a time, thank you so much. Um, uh, just, just as a thank you for helping you get set up and everything last year and, and and all of those things. And it's probably well beyond the shoulder now. I've been enjoying it, and I brought it up on this trip with me for this holiday. Sipping it here, perhaps it's because I'm sitting in this mash tun, but I think more likely on the back of these two new makes and hearing you talking about it as I sip it, I've never enjoyed a sip of the whiskey as much as I have just this moment. It's incredible. And I'd like, uh, the Whiskey Rev Graham has shared this with me. Maybe him and I will have an, another wee sip of this when he makes it back here and see if he's picking up the same depth in this whiskey. It's it's quite incredible. Yeah. So say well, again, we, we've got 20, every we've got things in this here from 1977, yeah. casks in here from 77, all the way through to 2013. Yeah, I mean, the oldest cask in there is actually from 1973, so 
um, 73, 40, sorry, yeah. Yep. 47 years old at the time of bottling. Um, so in terms of ratios, uh, and this is going to be a little bit of maths on the fly here, but 24% from the 70s, 9% from the 80s, uh, 26% from 1995, and then the final kind of 40% is a mix of those younger spirits in there as well. I think it's a kind of half and half there. So, you know, this is not so a case of... There will be people right now that's saying to you, why would you take 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s stock and vat it with such young stock? Why would you do that? What, where's, the, where's the financial sense in that? Where, why is that a, a reasonable thing to do? I think um, sometimes you almost have to look beyond that financial sense and go, you know, we could sell that 1977 cask for two, three thousand pound a bottle. But we can also do something in a product like Decades that creates a whiskey, unlike anything else, that really is able to catapult the, the brand. So the value is not just in the retail price, it's also in what it can do to bring tomato to people. And I think what people get to try when they try this is a sip of the portfolio of tomato. And that's an incredible, incredible thing. If we've got the stock to be able to do that, um, I think we should do it. And it's something that we're going to keep doing. We're going to continue to produce different iterations of decades with that multi-vintage vatting at, at its core. When the first one re was released back in 2011, it really was the first whiskey that kind of signaled that Tamatin is now a single malt producer rather than a producer for blends. And yeah. so, you know, it, it really did bring us to uh, the front of people's minds as a single malt. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And I think... Um, and also, I think that idea, just because somebody comes to a brand fairly recently or a brand is new to them, you also, it's nice to be able to demonstrate to them that you've got decades of depth, decades yeah. of experience, decades of stock in order to bring a product that is that is, that is essentially this. Yeah. And as, as Menno, Menno's multi-mission came in and said, now there's a non-age statement whiskey, because it is a non-age <laughs> statement. I That's actually right. used this as an example when we talked about young whiskey in a stream a couple of weeks ago in the VPUB. I used this as an example of where I think an, an age statement on this, just an age statement and nothing else, would betray the stocks that's actually used in the makeup of this. And it kind of makes me a wee bit frustrated that it's not possible to share more about the inspiration behind this, yes, but also about actually the percentages that you're sharing verbally right now, but I understand the reasons for that, Scott. Where are you headed to now? We're going to head over to the Phil House and get back on track, but just before we do, just with that, if you go to the Tomatin website and go to the Decades page, there is a little button at the bottom that says something to the effect of tell me more, and we'll send you all the percentages with when you click that button. It's part of this. Fantastic. Uh, so we're working out ways to not ruffle too many feathers while sharing more information. I think that's that's the spirit really? behind that. Fantastic, superb. Absolutely. Just touching finally on there, you know, when we ask about why we would do something like this, I think as well as single malt producers, for the last 124 years, we've also been whiskey blenders. So to be able yeah. to take that art of blending and apply it to single malt in a way like this, we talked about how I'm a whiskey geek, but Graham Yunson, who created this whiskey, he's a whiskey geek as well, and I think when you ask why why do that, I think the result is, speaks for itself, and anyone that tries that will understand why we've uh, taken that approach. Absolutely, we've got a few requests coming in, and it's one of my requests too. Before you depart that wee warehouse, huh? what's the chances of you giving us a glimpse at Graham Yunson's infamous 1976? I can do that. I can do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to head. Knows where it is. The stairs are here. This is like Challenge Annika. This is amazing. And the lighting's not great up here at the moment, Roy. I'll, I'll warn you. Um, we've got some really cool things going on up here. But what we're going to do is come right along here. And I know you can't see this so well. Um, oh, Graham's got the light on for me. So right beneath this window here are these casks that we call the blue ends. Can you see those? Yes, I see them. <laughs> so these are casks 33, 32, 29, and 30 from 1976. And these are what Graham regularly will tell you are the best whiskies that he has ever tried in his life. And 
I find it difficult to argue with them. Wow. So there they are for everybody that asked. There they are. Fantastic, Scott. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you so much, buddy. I look forward to seeing you then over at the Still House when the time suits you. Great stuff. See we'll you in a moment, buddy. Thank you. So there you go, Graham Yunson's infamous, it's more than just one 1976 cask. We don't know which one of those is his absolute favourite, but that's the stuff. And when Graham Yunson was talking about the magic of the cask on the V-Pub eh, late last year, he's, he's been on a V-Pub, he was a fantastic guest. I encourage everybody to watch that. Um, he talked uh, at length about uh, you know, his connection with uh, the whiskey and those casks which is why we got we got asked for those. Aaron McFault is saying, fantastic, what a finale. We are witnessing Aqua Vitae history. You did it again, Roy. So enjoying this. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Scott. A whiff of melancholy as well here. I long for the Highlands and the rest of Scotland. Yes, I understand completely. I have been drinking it in. I've been literally looking to the sky every day and saying, I love this. I love being here. And it's just that sense of being out and being able to experience it again. You will too, Aaron. You'll be here. And hopefully we'll get to share it together even. This is not the finale. There will be a final VPUB next week. Scotch versus the world will be the community kind of driven, a uh, fun uh, little topic for the, the final VPUB before the summer break. And that's going to be next week, Era. But thank you so much uh, for your virtual drama, friend. And it's lovely to have you in. Era McFault. And there was another uh, question. It was Menno's uh, question that I was. Uh, or has mentioned his comment about that being an on-edge statement potentially worth uh, spending money on. Certainly if you click that Fit Tell Me More button on the Tomatin website under the Decades page, you're going to understand uh, a wee bit more about the makeup. Scott was able to give us quite a good summary there of what's actually involved in this. Significant amounts of older stock from the 70s, 80s and 90s and some youthful stock in there as well to bring uh, vibrance and complexity and depth of flavour, of course. Gregor Dykeman is saying, eh, can Adam send my greetings to Neil from me and my dad? Eh, uh, uh, oh, can Scott Adamson send eh, my greetings to Neil from me? Eh, that must have been your tour guide. So Scott, that's greetings from Gregor Dykeman and his dad who was here and had a look around the distillery with Neil and he wants to send his greetings. Fantastic, Gregor. I'm sure that Scott will be happy to do that. Uh, Jimmy Legacy, saying, best thing that's happened in 1976 along with the Euro final that was held in Glasgow. Uh, cheers, Jimmy. <laughs> Fantastic. And Eb Head is saying, uh, he's, he's chatting to Pete Head. Superb. So Scott's going to head over to the still house now, and there we, we can get this. It's taken a wee bit longer than expected, but that's okay. It's a VPUB. If you're watching the replay, I appreciate it very, very much. You'll be able to pick it up um, on the timestamps underneath so that you can skip ahead to the points that interest to you. Remember, there is a Menno quiz tonight at the end. We're all going to be taking part. And I know that a lot of you have asked to see the Whiskey Rev too, so we'll maybe drag him in as well, maybe get a third wee seat so we can all sit alongside each other and go through the pain of a Menno quiz together live on air for you. Um, it's nice for me to not have to put a quiz together every now and again, but there is a lot of pressure because Menno's quizzes are legendary. They really are, but they're always good fun. So I encourage everybody who's interested in staying till the end to enjoy a Menno's quiz to please do that. So, and Jimmy, you will get to see the Whiskey Rev tonight if that happens to you. I will make him be here on camera. There was a once upon a time where, because our birthdays were the same, because we were always drinking the same whiskeys at the same time, way back at the start of the channel and things that people thought the Whiskey Rev and me were the same person, and that he was a made-up personality, but no, he definitely was not. Um, he's laughing, I can see him laughing in the background. Um, I think it looks like Scott is in place in the still house. Let's get the tour finished so that you can get back here and enjoy a couple of drams with us. We've still got this, the still house and the cooperage to cover before we bring Scott uh, back here alongside me. Give me a thumbs up, Scott, if you're in a good shape to welcome us over at uh, the still the Spirit Still and the Still House.
Hello and welcome to the Still House. Uh, Roy, hopefully you can hear me. I've put headphones on because, as I mentioned, we are still in the very last run of spirit here for the year uh, or for the season. And so uh, there's a little bit of noise. But the guys have told me that when we go upstairs, it'll be a little bit quieter. So we might be able to take them out then. But um, the reason we start below is because Tomatin's one of the unique distilleries that still works underneath the stills. If you had come here uh, before 2000, this big area in front of me here that you see, and there's Graham, <laughs> would have been filled with stills. We had 23 in here. Uh, but in 2001, 11 of the stills were removed and we're left with 12. So we run a balanced system here at Tomatin. And what that means is that for every nine ton mash, we will fill one wash back and ferment. And that will give us around about 42,000 litres of wash, which will go into three of our wash stills. Um, those three wash stills, the result of that, along with the uh, four shots and faints from the previous spirit run will fill two spirit stills. So although we have 12, we actually only use 10. We use all six of the wash stills and four of the spirit stills. Um, and yeah, we work below the stills here at Tomatin, which has its own unique features. Um, and you'll see in a minute, we'll uh, pull the, the knocker rather than looking in the looking glass. But I think what's interesting here um, is the big boil ball that you see in the neck of the still. Um, we know from records that a man called Alexander Mackenzie from King Yussi designed Tomatin Distillery in 1897. And he also designed the original Speyside Distillery. And one of his signatures was the boil ball in the neck of the still. So that's been a feature of Tomatin since 1897. You also see the tapered uh, neck of the still with the um, almost flat 90 degree angle line arm going out there. So what we're looking to do with our distillation at Tomatin is create reflux. And that's what that boil ball is all about. It's a very slow uh, distillation. Our wash distillation is around about 12 hours. Our spirit still distillation is 13 hours. And that's allowing us to create lots of reflux and get all of those light, fruity flavors to come forward into the tomatin unique spirit. Um, another cool thing that we've got here, very often we hear about um, worm tub condensers and how, I, I think they're very easy to understand what goes on. At tomatin we use shell and tube condensers, but we've actually taken one down so that people can get an understanding of how they work. So this is a shell and tube condenser. It would normally stand vertically up and down. And what would happen is the vapor comes off the neck of the still into this pipe here. And all of these tubes that you see inside the condenser are filled with cold water. And as the vapor hits onto those uh, tubes, it condenses back into a liquid and comes back out of this pipe here and into our spirit safes. So what we get there is loads and loads and loads of copper contact. And copper contact does a lot of things. It removes sulfurous compounds from the spirit. It helps create esters. Um, lots of really interesting chemical things going on there. Are you there? Yep. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Could you hear us okay? okay. Fantastic. Yes, I can hear you fine. I've just, uh, I was distracted there. I've got a wee message in from Owen, uh, Owen G. <laughs> he's supposed to be in the Highlands to celebrate his 50th birthday tomorrow, uh, but he's suffering from the dreaded C word that we don't mention on the channel and he's had to cancel his trip. Uh, and it means that he's sitting at home, which is a nightmare. Owen, I'm going to raise this glass and I'm going to ask the barflies, uh, uh, everybody that's tuning in tonight to raise a wee glass with you as well, buddy. Um, and to tell you that your your 50th isn't ruined, destroyed or cancelled, but is merely postponed, my friend. And in the meantime, I'll raise this glass of Tomat and Decades and wish you, Owen, a very happy 50th. Uh, recover, feel well, my friend, and get back to the Highlands fit and well soon. Happy birthday, yeah. Owen. Cheers. Owen, happy birthday. I hope you get better soon. And when you do make it up to the Highlands, let us know and we'll make sure you're taken care of when you come to Tomatin. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It's just Perfect. a postponement. 
So that, that's, that's really interesting to see the shell and tube condenser there turned on its side. It's something that I really, when the first time I saw it, I couldn't get my head around how that was actually working. Was the spirit coming through the tubes? Was it uh, was the spirit touching the outside of the tubes? Obviously, that's the latter is the case. But to see that again, a bit like you've cut open this mash tun here to give people a look, see inside a part of the process that otherwise we wouldn't normally get to see. It, somebody was asking, I don't know if it was Jimmy, somebody was asking what happened to the old original stills. Where did they end up? Do you know? So the old original stills, they would have, the way it worked was they were the original stills that we got rid of, you know, the stills from time immemorial. So the stills that we have here are the newest ones that were added in 1974. So those stills would have been coming towards the, of the end of their working life anyway. And the decision was made rather than replace them, we don't need them. And they would have been scrap popper. I, do, I think they were far beyond the point that they could be used by another distillery. Um, and at that point in time, there weren't a huge amount of distilleries uh, opening up looking for um, secondhand stills. So uh, they would have all been um, sold for scrap um, very much and probably helped Understood. fund some of the repairs of the, the other stills. And how close can you go to the spirit safe to, to, to show us what's happening there? Is it is it permitted? Yep. There we go. So you can see the spirit safe there. Roy, actually, last time you were here, we, we got the opportunity to open the spirit safe up, which was the first time I'd seen it. I was like a kid in a sweetie a kid in my own sweetie shop. Um, yeah, right. But we're right above the spirit safe here. And I can tell you that we are actually on um, faints at the moment. So this is the last of the spirit of the year coming down. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, yes, there we go. It, yes. There we go. So that is as at the spirit safes. And so that's a, another crucial point. I'm aware that I told you that I was going to tell you about the differences between Tomatin and Kubokin production, and we've skipped over quite a lot of them already, um, almost accidentally. So the first one would be uh, the fermentation for Kubokin is a lot shorter than the Tomatin. That 168 hours that we use for Tomatin, it's much shorter for Kubokin, closer to the 52 hour mark. And that's so we get more of the flavors from the cereal from the barley itself, from the phenolics. Um, and that will come through here. And the big point of difference, as well as the peated barley, is the distillation regime. So for tomatin, we will run our four shots uh, on our second distillation. We will run our four shots for 30 minutes. Um, and then we will come on spirit. And that will run right through down to 65% ABV. And that's when we'll come off spirit. So for tomato, and we're generally collecting between between about 72 and 74, right down to 65. So all of those lighter, uh, those higher volatiles. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with how uh, spirit coming across works, the lightest volatile compounds come over the neck of the still first and condense. And they're the lightest flavor compounds. And then progressively, the more heavier volatiles will come through. And so in that way, a distillation run, a, the run of a still can be seen as a spectrum of flavor, starting with the very lightest and working our way towards the heavier compounds. And so when we take that second cut and come off spirit, we'll determine how light, how fruity, or how malty and how heavy our spirit is. With tomatin, we're coming off at 65% ABV, and that's giving us that Lovely, uh, all the flavors that you mentioned there in the new mix spirit, Roy. And that was the same for the chocolate malt. Uh, but with Kubokin, we come right down to 60% ABV. Uh, so a much longer cut, collecting much more of those phenolic compounds. One other thing I should have mentioned about Kubokin that's something I'm really, really excited about. We've not done it yet, but from this December, Kubokin will be using exclusively Golden Promise Barley. We're going to be using Heritage Barley variety for Kubalkin wow. production. Um, and that is to go back to, and we'll talk about it when we're trying the whiskey, to that much more traditional, uh, historic Highland style of whiskey that was made at Tomatin up until the 1950s. That's what Kubalkin will be um, before going into cask. Fascinating. I'd like to hear more about that, going back to Golden Promise again. And it, there are so many people that rave about Golden Promise. I know that it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a heavily debated 
topic, but you've obviously chosen to do it for a reason, and I look forward to hearing more about that. The interesting questions coming in from both uh, Roland and Menno. Uh, sorry, not Roland, uh, Ronald and Menno have both, both asking, given that's the last run of your season right now, and that's the chocolate malt that's running now, I guess? No, so actually the chocolate malt finished running on Tuesday, and we've done right, one, we're doing one last run of standard production, and then that will clear the uh, fence through uh, of the chocolate malt. So when we come back onto production um, after the next two months, we'll be straight back into standard tomato. And so we, we almost look at all of these experiments, they will have um, shoulders. So you'll have shoulders going into the experiment where you have the four shots and feints from the previous distillation and you have the shoulder on the other end. And we collect all of that as one, um, as well as the peak, as well as the head where it's pure chocolate malt. And that will be a good account of how that spirit's performed. And, and when you when you run your final, uh, Ronald and Menno's asking when you your final run of the season, what happens to the feints? Do they do they get, are they stored? Are they what happens? We try and run them off as much as possible. We try and get that to as low a volume as possible. And then what will happen is what's left will be stored. And we've got two receivers here. And what we'll do is they'll be stored in one. And then in the other one that's empty, we'll have to clear the verdigris out. And then the uh, the low wines will be moved into that receiver and then the tank that they've just come from will clear the verdigris out of that one. So we have our low wines from the last run, uh, but they're in perfectly clear tanks ready for the season to start up again. And they will be added to um, the first wash distillation in the spirit stills. Fantastic. I hope Fantastic. that makes sense and isn't too convoluted. It's a lot of moving parts there. It is, and it is, we, we imagine this fairly linear process when you think of distillation, you know, but we forget that there are lots of receiver tanks and feeders and storage and, and vessels around the process that have got to help us move this liquid from place to place. Um, there, there have been some questions coming in about Kuboken. Uh, Snowy's asking about the oldest Kuboken uh, and what's the oldest, when it was started to be made and what is the oldest that you have. I think we're going to touch upon Kuboken a wee bit later in the stream, Snowy. I hope we can get to that for you. Um, but I'm going to ask Scott, we're seeing some nice... Uh, uh, and look at these stills, because so many distilleries you go to, you have these really kind of ornate and highly polished and very well-presented stills. Tomatin, again, very similar to the outside. These stills are clearly working stills. Yeah, um, that's right. what, what are we looking at here, Scott? So these are our wash stills um, at Tomatin. So like I say, we've got six of them all in production. Actually, something that's really interesting, Roy, when we talk about the cleanliness of the still, that actually has an impact on the spirit quality. You know, when you see these shiny, shiny stills, um, that's not conducive to creating reflux. Um, the darker the outside of the still, the more patina that is, the less of a heat differential there is from the outside and the inside. And it means that the neck of the still is cooler, which will create just that little bit more reflux. So that's, it's not done for, uh, absolutely, you can see these polished, shiny ones that are very pretty, but actually there's a function the keeping the patina there. What you'll also see inside, maybe not the best lighting, but we use uh, steam uh, heating here at Tomatin through uh, steam pans in the stills. Uh, historically coal fired, then it went to oil firing, but that didn't work out so well. And then we moved to steam um, in the 1960s, I believe. Fantastic, superb. So we've got one more stop left, Scott, I believe, one more place to go on a wee tour, a wee look-see inside Tomatin. And I think you may have saved one of the most interesting points to last because not every distillery has an on-site cooperage, right? I know That's some right, folk yeah. have been asking about it. Are you heading over there now? That's where we're going. Superb, my friend. Thank you so much. I look forward to picking you up over at the cooperage. See you soon. See you in a sec. I hope this is working out okay. I hope you're getting that sense of actually we're at, we are in a distillery. I'm sitting to you inside an old disused mash tun inside Tomatin Distillery and um, doing our very, very best to, to bring some kind of technical, uh, te te technically functional presentation to you. Well, Scott is going round five different points in the distillery. He joined us from the outside. Um, then he came into uh, the mash room and the fermentation room. Uh, then he nipped across to the warehouse. He's now finished in the still house there, the still room. Uh, and the uh, next to the spirit safe, the spirit safe, and he's heading across to the cooperage now to join us 
uh, from there. Uh, I hope you're finding it fascinating. Red Sox 367 has said that very one. Fascinating. Thank you, Red Sox. Good to have you in. And Simon Ray is here saying, can you ask Scott uh, whether there are any plans to do another Kubokan finished in a Black Isle Brewery barrel? That's interesting. I think it's one of the creations that's actually sitting here just now, Simon. So I hope that we'll get to that. Molasses is here saying this is a spectacular remote VPUB. I'm very, very grateful you're enjoying it more and I hope it's coming in nice and clear for you to watch as well. Working very well, Roy says precarious, Dave. Fantastic, Dave. Thank you so much, my friend. Peter is saying interesting and enjoyable. And Alan Newland is saying uh, uh, just as pain for a visit. I know there is an element of that and there was a kind of anxiety in me that it was a kind of like, uh, it was atonal a wee bit for me to, to go and say, oh, look, I can visit a distillery and you can't. But it's the best we can do is to kind of give that letterbox look inside the distillery that wee bit of a peek. Um, while we're all having to play a wee bit of a waiting game to travel, I'm so desperate to get to the festivals on the continent, to get to the trip to Texas this year, of course, to get to see my friends and my whiskey friends everywhere, to get to see my family, for crying out loud. But things are opening up slowly. Maybe there is some real excitement about uh, the near future and certainly next year. Um, and I encourage you all to come and see Tomatin for what Tomatin actually is, a very, very functional testament to Scotch whisky and Scotch whisky production history. It's quite fascinating when you see the scale of everything and the place that Tomatin has in Scotch whisky's uh, landscape. Tommy Elmer is saying, when do they start up again for the new season and how long is the shutdown for? Good question, eh, Tom. I'll try and pitch that. I've got another one here about a uh, Kubokan ages also from you as well. New season from Tom. I'll try and remember that one, Tom. Gregor is saying, best VPUB so far for me. I just love to man. Thanks, Gregor. Thanks so much, my friend. Lucas is saying, thank you. Thank you, Roy, for all your time and effort. We do love it. I'm very grateful, Lucas. Thank you for participating and enjoying it. Good to see Russell Whiskey and as well, my friend, good to welcome you here. So we're going to, um, we've got the Cooperage to go to and then I want to get Scott, and I want to get the whiskey rev back here so we can sit down and enjoy a wee dram before we throw ourselves into the brutal uh, challenge of Menno's quiz uh, and just relax and have a kind of summary and have a look at some of the interesting whiskies he's got here. I've picked up a label on one that is absolutely very interesting to me, so I wonder if that's for tasting tonight. We'll wait and see. Uh, I hope that you're all enjoying this. It looks like Scott may be in the Cooperage. Give me a thumbs up if he is. Fantastic. We can go over to see a very unique feature that we have at Tomatin Distillery, and that is the fact that we have an on-site cooperage. Welcome to the cask store at Tomatin. We're just about to go into the Cooperage. But before we do, I always think it's important to talk about the cask store itself. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the things that we've been delighted to be able to do over the last 10, 20 years or so has been to experiment with such a wide variety of casks. As I said earlier on, when we were bought over by the Callinghams in 1909, as wine merchants, they brought with them a wide variety of wood types to use at the distillery. That was lost for many, many years, but it's been reinvigorated in the last 20 or 30 years ago it's with the single malt boom and the demand for difference in flavours. But one of the real reasons that we've been able to do that has been with the cooperage on site here. We absolutely work with uh, cooperages like um, the Speyside Cooperage, they're a great partner of ours. We work with the Kelvin Cooperage over in Kentucky as well. But what having our own cooperage on site allows us to do is work directly not only with small boutique um, cask suppliers 
and brokerages, but also directly with wineries um, from around the world as well, uh, because we have the full control over the cask when it gets here. Every cask that comes to Madden comes into the cask store here. Um, we'll just pan around to show you. And when it arrives here, it will be taken into the cooperage for a quality control check, very much like a MOD or a service for your car. The task has to be checked before we fill it. So every single task that we have used at Mappin comes into this building. It will be assessed by our cooper. And if any work is required, you'll take it into the cooperage here where we're about to go. Um, Roy, just as we're moving there, you've got three bottles in front of you that I think um, explore this concept very well. We've got the Tomatin 14-year-old, which has matured in Tony Port Pipes from the Symington family um, over in Portugal. We have yep. our UK exclusive, which has been finished in Fino Sherry Cask. And we have one of the bottles from our very new uh, French collection. Um, I believe you have the Riso edition on front of you there. Um, and that's been matured in Riso casks from uh, Languedoc, Brazilian on the south coast of France. And now, of course, I have to ask um, uh, which one of these... Uh, it's, oops. Which one of these am I actually supposed to be trying here? Because I, I think what I should just be doing is really taking three glasses. <laughs> While you're not here to stop me, <laughs> just right. pour a wee tiny drop of each. What do you think about that? This is a 2008. That's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, you just need to stand a wee bit closer to that mic. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to move towards the... If you can. Is that better? I'm going to move towards the cooperage now while you're pouring anyway. You're, um, you're nice and clear there. Now just, be, just, just for posterity, it's just a wee tiny taste I'm taking. <laughs> it is tempting. You can see some of the reeds and the hoops that the, the cooper will use here. And then we're moving into the cooperage itself. Um, and as I say, it is a small cooperage. We have one cooper, his name's Alan Bartlett. Um, he did his apprenticeship here under Ian Duffy um, and has been our head cooper for the uh, last few years now. And this is where he worked. Um, this is his little workshop. There's no casks here at the moment, um, which suggests that they're all in good working order. Um, but you'll see all his tools kicking about. The, the hammers, the bung floggers, all the hoop drivers as well. Um, perhaps the most important tool for a cooper is his um, stereo. That's always important. <laughs> and you see in the background there the big hoop driver. That's the uh, only industrial part of the coopering that we do here. Everything else is done by hand. Um, when we need casks, e chard and rechard, they get sent over to Speyside Cooperage for that piece of work. Superb. Superb. And you can see, again, this, is, this isn't a very pretty, attractive kind of museum-type setup that we've been taken into here. This is, act, I've been here when, when it's active, and it's a noisy, busy place. Yeah. So, and you can actually see that this is, what we're getting to see inside here is this is not, uh, you know, a pretty, well-presented thing. This is a real working and every beat of tomato and every step you take every place you look in for the most part it looks very much like that you can see you're getting to see a, a working distillery i've just had a wee sip of that uh reeve salt cask the 2008 12 years old very reminiscent to me bizarrely of palo cortado very, very rich and bold flavors very interesting so and the second one Sorry, go ahead. A really interesting wine. Um, so it's made in this southern part of France, but it's made in a very similar process to sherry and particularly port. It's when you try the Riesel wine in of itself, it's like a port. It's made through um, fortification or as the French call it, moutage. So as the wine is fermenting, spirit will be added to kill the fermentation while there is still sugar in the wine. Um, but what's really cool about Riesel is after they've done that, they will fill the wine into glass demijohns, or as they call them, bonbons, uh, between like five and 20 litres, and they will leave them out in the sun for a whole year. So there's big differences in temperature and humidity. There's daylight, there's darkness, and that all has an oxidising effect on the wine, 
before it's even been put into cask. So really, really interesting wine. And I do, I find myself dancing between um, the influence of port and the influence of sherry. It's kind of in that middle ground. Uh, so Palo Cotardo, that funky sherry is kind of right. Yes, that's super interesting. We were talking about last week uh, in the VPUB, we were talking about uh, the effect of, you know, cask maturation versus uh, aging in glass for the, the likes of the example we used what was Eau de Vie. Um, yep. Stefan was talking about Eau de Vie and how the, 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 that's basically aged or it develops over time in glass. So it's interesting that not only is that happening with this style of wine, but they're actively encouraging things like the sun and the outside temperature fluctuation of things to develop the wine before it goes on into cask. There's lots of very interesting, very unique flavors going on in this first one. That's super interesting. The next one as well seems to be just a couple of years older, but interestingly, much paler. Yeah. You can see the color difference there between the two. This is the Reeve Saw here. And this is a 2006 Fino Sherry Cask, Scott. Is this part of the same series? No. So the French collection um, is all from 2008. There is uh, four editions of the French collection. They're all 12 years old. And they um, they all started off as the same new mixed spirit. They were all filled into refill hogsheads for nine years and vatted together and then filled into Mombasiac, Sauterne, Beef Salt and Cognac casts. Um, the Fino edition that you have next to you is a UK exclusive product. Um, it was released only for the UK market. Um, and it's... It's kind of a remnant from the, the Quattro series we did a few years back where we looked at four different sherry styles. And I think anyone that talks to me about something that isn't whiskey will hear me rattling on about how much I love Fino Sherry. Um, so Fino Sherry matured whiskey for me. I love showing it to people who say I love sherry matured whiskey um, because it's a little bit like that thing where people say I don't like peated whiskey and you show them a Kubok and Fino sherry is such a different take on the sherry bomb. And I would say that that is a sherry bomb, but by no means the nutty dried fruit flavors that you expect from your Olorosos and maybe your PXs. This is a sherry bomb for someone who is drawn to or more attracted to a lighter style like ex bourbon or refill cask. There's, lovely, there's a lovely sweetness here. Um, there is... I think you may pick it out as being sh maybe the color is deceptive because it's very pale, but I think you may pick out the, that kind of that that lovely kind of uh, fruity, slightly spiced sherry influence here. But it's a completely different take. This would be one to pour for a sherry lover in a blue glass, and also one to pour for a ex bourbon cask lover in a clear glass. If that makes any sense at all. 100%. One of the things that I love about that is it does have those classic tomato hallmarks of the sweet fruity flavours, but what it also has is a olive oil and sourdough bread sort wow. of thing going on. There's a savoury note there that's really atypical for tomato. So I, I love that whiskey and really, really interesting stuff. And almost a slightly, beyond the sweetness, a slightly minerally a element to it too, maybe, yeah. maybe, and that olive oil thing that you're talking about, I definitely get. Yeah, super interesting. 2006. It's a shame that it's a UK exclusive, um, but I, I mean, it's, it's it's an interesting thing, and I guess that that's maybe the type of thing that, with a bit of success or a bit of a good reception behind it, there's perhaps stocks available to do a wider release. I don't know. But it's, it's certainly something that's not as available as Oloroso casks, but when we find them, we get them. I'm really glad you picked up on the minerality there because um, when we launched it last year, uh, we invited Moa Nielsen, Swedish whiskey girl, onto the, our channel to, to talk about it. And one of her tasting notes, it was really interesting, and I'm probably butchering it, I don't think it's exactly right, but she said it reminded her of a wet castle wall. And I thought that was a, a really interesting tasting note. I don't know what she was doing to have that stored as a tasting note. But like you say, it's that minerality there. And I don't think that's something that's talked about enough in single malt. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just, it's very, it's, it's kind of like when you talk to people about that, it's almost like you've licked a pebble or a stone and they <laughs> look at you and think, what, why would you be licking pebbles? And of course, we don't do these things. We don't eat or chew leather or wood or whatever, but we still get the notes. We still get the flavors in it. Absolutely. And finally, we've got... Um, and I'll be honest with you, portwood and whiskey is something I, I'm not always drawn to, even the ones that I enjoy. 
they're probably enjoyed. But I know that's a very personal thing to me because I know that port matured whiskey um, is very, very popular and very well received. This is 14 years old, yeah. but it's not 14 years in port, is it? No, that's right. Um, I'm on the opposite end of uh, the conversation with you there, Roy. The 14 year old for me is my daily drinker. Uh, I call it my Xbox whiskey. It's my get home from work, put the sun to bed, relax, and have a dram whiskey. Um, what we've done here is it's 11, 12 years in refill American oak hogsheads. So the starting point for all of our finishes at Tomatin is refill American oak hogsheads. I can't talk about them enough. They are the workhorses of the whiskey industry. They're the unsung heroes of the whiskey industry. They allow that tomato character to develop and mellow, and they get us to the perfect starting ground for our finishes. And then it will spend two to three years in port casks. But what's really different here compared to the vast majority of port matured whiskies is we're looking at tawny port casks here, not ruby, which you tend to find. These casks have been used by the Symington family for around 50 years, holding port, holding port over and over and over again. So there's huge amounts of flavour there. And what I find different is it's maybe not the fresh strawberries and raspberries that you get from ruby casks. For me, it's more of the forest fruits. I get some cherries, I get a little blackberry, I get some peach in there as well, um, and then some honeycomb. I think it works really, really well with the tomato and new make spirit. In saying that, we don't have anything against ruby casks. We've used them plenty of times, but for the 14-year-old, we're looking to add depth and a little bit more of that deeper fruit flavors. There's a nice light dryness to the finish on it. It's a little bit like fresh currants or something like that, a fruit that kind of leaves your palate that little bit dry, almost like, um, yeah. I, I, the interesting, you said honeycomb. Yeah. That, that, that that drew to focus some sweetness for me that the, the dryness was distracting me from. It's absolutely there, a nice honeycomb sweetness. But this is quite a dry whiskey. It's one of those ones that you it leaves a palate wanting a wee sip, a top-up yep. sip. Yep. Um, it's lots of jam, jam notes in here, maybe currant jam, maybe maybe you could maybe you could suggest strawberries to me. I know you mentioned strawberries there, but that's more a kind of note associated with Ruby Port, perhaps. I don't know. But it's 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 there, it's berries, cooked jams, yeah, that kind of thing. I think that's a great point. What I find for me personally is that on the nose, all those berries and fruits are actually on the fresher side. Even the spices are quite fresh. But when you taste it, it's all those reduced jam, marmalades, even that spice. I, I get a ginger note, but it's kind of like a candied ginger. It all gets preserved on the palate. And I, I love that transition from the freshness of the nose to the um, the preserved nature of the palate. And then, as you say, that slightly dry finish there. Fantastic, Scott. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I know there's other whiskies that you want to talk about. We want to talk a wee bit about the Kubokans. There's one here with a handwritten label on it that I'm very intrigued about. Um, <laughs> yep. if, are, are, are you good with your tour? Are you ready to come back here and sit with me and get the tour into we'll summarising and doing some other things? Yeah, we'll be back with you in about five minutes. Uh, put your metal jacket on because you'll be enduring a menu quiz as well, my friend. <laughs> Thanks. I'll see you very shortly. Fantastic. I hope, oops, I've got Menno in here as well. Sorry, Menno, I should have given you a heads up that I was going to drag you in as well. I'm just making sure that you're comfortable there and ready for a wee bit of a quiz later on. Um, we're good to go. We're in good. Oops, you're, you're muted right now. No, I'm not. Oh, no, I can hear you now. Yes, sorry, you were just a wee bit quiet. Um, so the idea is that um, once in a while, every few weeks, by very, very popular request, um, we have uh, by somebody two, else. By two host, barflies. I'm sorry? By two barflies. 
<laughs> but, no, no, seriously. I mean, people are going, it's time for a menu quiz. Now, we had to fit it in before the end of uh, the, 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 I don't want to say end of the season. That sounds really pretentious. But before we break for the summer break, we had to have a menu quiz. Next week, it's a very, very busy quiz with lots of people coming in to do a Scotch versus the world. But tonight, Menno, you're going to bring us a, a challenging quiz. And myself, yep. Scott Adamson, and perhaps if we can uh, convince him, if we can bully him into joining us, maybe the Whiskey Rev as well will sit alongside us and participate in your quiz. I'm looking forward to it. Is that okay? Are you good for time? Absolutely. Fantastic, my friend. I look forward to welcoming you in a wee minute. Thank you, Menno. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Well, an amazing thing to be able to do as well, just to follow Scott round to Matten Distillery. And can I say that you will come to Scotland on your whiskey journey and you will visit distilleries, I hope. And you'll get to see the picturesque ones that are absolutely worth your time. You'll get to see the big industrial scale ones, the big cathedrals like I talk about, like McAllen. You'll get to see the new distilleries that have just started up. You'll get to see the small scale ones like Edradour and like Ballandalach, like Springbank. You get to see all these amazing things, all the fantastic uh, whiskey production that goes on in places like Isla and the Western Highlands. But I encourage you to try and fit in Tomatin or a distillery like Tomatin because it's unique. And every distillery like it offers something unique. This is a working distillery. This is something that you get the impression that every step around that everything is here for a very practical purpose, and that is to make malt scotch whiskey. And the structure and the scale and the shape of this distillery has, has almost kind of expanded and shrunk and expanded and shrunk around the needs of the industry over the years, and it bears all of those battle scars on it at every turn. And for a whiskey geek, for a whiskey enthusiast, it makes it fascinating. And it means that when you do pick up a glass of these whiskies, this is the evangelist speaking now, but it's true, and I think you know it to be true, when you pick up a glass of these whiskies to enjoy them in the future, you start to understand them on a completely new level. Like when I was sipping that decades tonight, it's, it's the most enjoyable sip of a decades I've ever had. It's quite incredible. Somebody's bought me a dram. Curtis Campbell, my friend, he's bought me a wee dram to say fantastic tour. Thank you, Roy, and a big thanks to Scott. A big thanks to my friend, the Whiskey Rev, as well, for holding the camera most of the way around there. Uh, we are, our families are up, uh, spending some time in the Highlands together, um, and uh, he came along. He gave up his evening to come along and help out tonight, uh, and I'm very, very grateful that he did, too. I actually think he wanted to have a wee sneak peek behind the scenes, too. Uh, I hope he's enjoying it. Ander Garcia is in. Good to have you, Ander. I have to say that I'm enjoying so much this V-Pub. Thank you so much, Agavidi and Tomatin, for giving us the possibility of being in a distillery in these times. Thank you, Ander. It's wonderful. It's always wonderful to welcome you in the V-Pub, and it's nice to have you in this evening, my friend. Bud Jenkins, my friend, is in. Thanks to you and Scott for a fantastic tour and live event. You just keep delivering great experiences for us, Roy. Bud, thank you very, very much. Can I say that all of the kit that made this happen tonight, everything has been made possible by you, by this community, by this audience, by the people that tune in, and especially by the people that support the Barflies and the amazing patronage I have inside Patreon as well. Everybody was looking at the kit that it takes to set this up, and it is quite complex. Um, and as I explained that the only thing that is legacy, the only thing that once belonged to me before Aquaviti was this laptop that I'm using here. Everything else, the camera, the audio, the lights, the cables, the every single piece of hardware has been funded by patrons. It's quite a privilege and an amazing thing eh, to be able to thank you for. One more drama has come in from Jolly Rover. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much, Ryan Scott. This was a brilliant idea and an even better delivery. Loving this new format and love how the whiskey community is a real community. You don't know how close you are to the truth, my friend. I cannot wait till we're all back together, enjoying each other's company as we share these moments in whiskey. Graham Fraser brought me a dram as well to say a great V for Brian Scott and a fantastic night. Let's bring in Scott, who's just back. I'll need to scooch a wee bit over here so you can see that rake in the background, the mash tun. I think we got away with that, Scott. I think it worked out well. Thanks very much to the Rev for his camera work there. Uh, you're going to be bullied into joining us for the quiz. So I hope you're uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready for a bit of that in a wee minute, my friend. But thanks very much for supporting there. I think it worked well. And I'm barring a drop in audio at a couple of points, I was making the point on you as you walked back here 
that it's wonderful to see the cathedral that is McAllen. It's wonderful to see the quirkiness and the hands-on that is Springbank. It's wonderful to see all the Isla distilleries. Everything's unique. If you come to Tomatin, you get a sense of a distillery that is here to perform a very specific function and bears scars of its time through the expansion and contraction of the industry over the years. Even, yeah. even this mash tun, um, even the shell and tube condenser sitting on its side there, everything, there's a sense of now, very active, very vibrant, thriving distillery, and at every corner, a reflection or a relic or something looking to the yeah. past. 100%. I've, I've often told people that um, if you want to go and see a distillery, you can go and see a distillery. If you want to go and see a museum, you can go and see a museum. But there's very few places you can come and see both a functioning distillery and a whiskey museum in the one place. And to me, it's that it's, it's a story um, in a building. Yes. And that's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, and I think it's not it's not the type of thing that you would come around and see and it would be very presented in a very succinct way in order for you to take something and digest it and move on to the next thing. You have to look for these touch points. You have to see these things. Why is that building like, what's that gap yeah. there? And what is that old thing that's lying there? And why is that like this? And what, these buildings are all very different ages. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, and this is at the point, by the way, that you've driven through the estate that houses the distillery or the house that you used to have. Yeah. Which, by the way, people are trying to rent out. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I think that's a great point because I've been here um, the better part of nine years now. Um, lived on site for four years. Very lucky to be one of the few brand ambassadors that gets to actually be based at the distillery, you know. So yes. spend a lot of time here. And every day I come in and I go, I wonder why that's like that. Or I wonder what that is. Yeah. Or I wonder what the story of that is. I remember one year I was, um, I wanted to build a decking in the back of the garden. And I dug up some turf. It was kind of like a raised garden. And I dug up some turf yeah. and I found loads of red bricks laid out like a patio. And I was speaking to one of my neighbours. And it turned out that that was the old chimney from the Maltines, that once it was knocked down, all the locals came and took the bricks for their, for their paving. And then it just grew to over, over patios the years. and yeah. paths and paving. And and just yeah. incredible that that is still there. Not only that that uh, bricks were still there, but somebody knew where they had come yeah. from. I, I love that about this place. The canny Scott, you know, reclaim and reuse, yeah. right? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of drams coming in. I don't want to make these. Donna Pass Whiskey, Tim is saying thanks to all the work you have put into this. I'm glad it's also a family weekend vacation with you and your friend, The Rev. Uh, well, have a great time. Thank you so much, Tim. It's always amazing to have you here and your support, my friend. And Benny Fries is in saying, um, this is a treat. Love the idea, love the concept. And Scott being Scott again, i.e. amazing. Uh, a humble thanks to both of you and the Whiskey Rev, not least behind the camera. Thank you so much, Benny. Amazing to have your support. Oh, another one coming in from Daniel Williams. Loved every second of the content. Please give us more of this. Have a dram on me, Slancha. I think this, it's a possibility to do this, not just from inside distilleries, but take the V-Pub to Whiskey. Anywhere where there's a data connection and power. <laughs> we need it to be solid and steady, but it seems to be working okay tonight. Fantastic. I think if you can get a connection inside a mash tun, you'll probably get a connection most places. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, th I think that, um, uh, you know, with 4G expanding, we're getting access to more and more places. And what we worked out tonight is that where the Wi-Fi dropped out, you were able to jump on. So even in the centre, right in the centre of the Scottish Islands where yeah. we are here, yeah. we're starting to get a uh, well served with 4G, which is amazing too. As you were walking around, I sipped through uh, these three, uh, well, two special editions and a staple core range, the 14-year-old port, uh, port cask is a core range product. Um, but a UK release of Fino, I think there's a few disappointed people that that's the case, um, such as the, the way of things. I hope that that gets out there because it's a very interesting take on sherry, absolutely, as I've experienced in the past with Fino, it's quite a nice mm -hmm. ch change of very pace. Reef salt was a standout for me. Okay. Uh, it's Excellent. just that it's the reason that I love the Palo Cartado Deanstons. It's the reason I love that kind of, it's a richness there that switches backwards and forwards and it doesn't want to tell you what kind of cask it is. Mm -hmm. One minute it's sweet, one minute it's, it's very kind of barley driven and kind of very malty and the next minute it's quite savoury and the next minute it's kind of spiced. There's a nice, a lovely ginger spice to this one. Yep. Um, that is one that I'm interested in. Good. Uh, absolutely. Good. I, I thought it was, the, the, the for me, the one I really enjoyed for my own personal tastes. Excellent. But what else have we got? We're, we're going to mention Kuboken. We are, yeah. 
And there has been some questions coming in about what is the oldest uh, Kuboken and mm -hmm. how long have you been making it? And there's a couple of interesting stories there, right? Because yes. There were, my brother owns a Kuboken from back when before you were making Kuboken. That's so right. how can that be That's the case? Right. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll, we'll start with when Kuboken begun on purpose. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. So the history really is that up until the nineteen, up until the nineteen sixties, when North Sea oil was discovered, most distilleries in the Highlands and Speyside produced peated whisky because peat was the fuel source. It was the source of heat, not just for drying barley, but for fireplaces and houses in the Highlands here, for drying clothes, for everything. So peat was used, but very, very different in style from what we expect of that peated whiskey today, that Isla yeah. heavily phenolic. It was much lighter. Um, it was dug from the land here, malted on site. And um, that tapered off in the 1960s, also at the time that we developed that light fruity spirit tomato that you've tried today, which shot us to massive popularity with blenders, but also gives us the versatility today to use all of these different casks. But in 2005, uh, Dougie, our master distiller at the time, um, noted that the price of peated malt for blending was starting to skyrocket. Everybody yes. started to yep. buy the stuff. Um, so it got more expensive. And he looked at the massive distillery that he had and said, you know, I, I could make peated whiskey for the last week of the year. So we bought in a batch of peated barley for the very last week of production in December. 2005. 2005, yep. December 2005. And we run it through the stills and we got this wonderful spirit um, and filled it into first fill bourbon, first fill Olorosa sherry, um, first fill virgin oak and refill casks. And those are the casks that are now used to produce the Kubalkin signature that we'll go on and try. Um, actually, maybe that's a good time to pour that now. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's pour one for the Rev as well, who's got to be thirsty yeah. after all his work. Do we need some more glasses? Yeah, I think he's got some there. Do you? Is this glass okay for you? Yeah, that one's not been used. Okay, perfect. Uh, then this one's good for me. Superb. Fantastic. There is so much whiskey on the table in front of us here. <laughs> what a wonderful place to find yourself <laughs> in. <laughs> so this is, uh, which Kubokin is this? So this is Kubokin Signature. So the way ah, the Kubokin okay. range has yep. been designed, um, so I'll go back to it. So we filled these three cask pipes, the bourbon, virgin oak, and sherry in 2005. And then we originally released Kubokin in, in 2013, making use of those three cask pipes. And that has remained the core product of the Kubokin range, even through the most recent rebrand. But over that 15 years, we've filled around about 60 different types of cask with Kubokin spirit. And that is the... Um, what we use for the Kubalkin creations. Yep. We still only make it for one or two weeks every winter, still with that lightly peated barley, very, very small part of our production. And so Signature is the only core product that we have. And then the creations are limited batch releases. Once they're gone, they'll be replaced. So we're going to be releasing creation three and four this year. Um, but as I said, the oldest Kubalkin by design was 2005. But about a year after we released Kubalkin, um, I think it was around about summer of 2014, Charlie Edwards, who was uh, one of the production managers here, brought over three um, cask samples and they just said 1989 on them. And he said, try those and tell me what you think. And we tried them and we're like, I, I, peaty. I, I, what distillery are they from, from 1989? Because these are quite peaty. Yeah. And he said, they're, they're ours. No, they're not. You know, we never made peated whiskey at that time. And we uh, spoke to a few of the guys that still work here. Uh, Martin Henry, who's our head mashman here, uh, we spoke to him and tried to find out what was going on. And it turns out that in the 1980s, we were still producing at a fair pace. And um, a batch of peated barley arrived at the distillery, I think it was July 1989, uh, by accident. But because we were producing so much, we didn't have time to... Um, to Send refuse the batch. Yes. And at that time, in all honesty, most of what we were producing was going to become um, blend anyway. So we just sort of said, you know, this will be a problem for a long, long time. Let, uh -huh. Let's do it. And um, those three casks were the remnant of that. So we bottled that as a Kubok in 1989. Um, I found another couple of examples from that spirit. There was an SMWS bottling many, many years ago um, that I have at home of 
uh, peated, peated tomato. tomato. Um, now, but, but my brothers, I th okay, am I going to enter? Do you know what you're going to exactly, follow up? Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, continue. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what happened then? That 1989 was so beloved that we thought, you know, it was that mix of intense tropical tomato, 1980s fruits, wow. and phenolics. And, and over time, those phenolics will be integrated. They'll be part of the spirit. They won't be like a big peat hit. It'll be something that's, you know, probably very close to a traditional Highland style yeah. before the dynamics that changed. Yeah. It, it, it was released um, the same year that I went to Limburg Whiskey Festival and someone gave me an old, I think it was a 1970s uh, sample of Beaumont. And it reminded and me massively of that this tropical, peat, just yeah. with that light peat. So of course people loved it. I yeah. loved it. Yes. Um, I, it's um, one of my favorite whiskies we've ever been a part of. And we said, let's see what we can do to recreate that. So what we did was we took some standard tomato non-peated whiskey and we matured it, uh, we finished it in Isla Casks. Isla Casks. And we did that for a 1988 and a 1990. Um, and they, as you'd expect, they didn't have that same integration of peat, but what they had was a salinity that we've never had in tomato with 315 meters above sea level. Yeah. What is salt doing in there? Yeah. It was really, really nice to see that come through and how that played out alongside those fruitier, lighter flavors. Well, what I'm picking up on these two here with the, the signature Kuboken, which I think, I know it's an on edge statement, it's a peated whiskey, but if you're gonna, if you enjoy peated whiskey and you want to kind of switch things up a wee bit, the value of the signature Kuboken as well, it's, it's similar to the legacy in a lot of ways, we were more expensive, but it's 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 great, great value for a peated whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, if I know the peated you make, uh, okay, this is peat, this is peat, peat, peat. Yeah. And on this, sure, it's a wee bit smoky, but everything is dialed back and quieter. So there's a reason for that as well. Okay. So from 2005 to 2012, the, um, the level of peat in the barley, the PPM, was 15 PPM. And since then, we've been steadily increasing it. So the new mix spirit that you've got there wow. has a PPM of 40 in the barley. Um, so it is a much more peat forward spirit there. But the um, Kubokin that you're drinking, um, all the Kubokin signature, all the whiskey that goes in here is a minimum of nine years old. Um, so the bourbon, the so sherry. So that answers virginal, the questions that were coming in. Minimum, minimum of, of nine years, years old. And the, the ratio is... 60% bourbon fully matured, 25% Oloroso fully matured, and 15% virgin oak fully matured. Excellent. That's excellent, and it's great to hear. The, I've had a dram brought to me by uh, Magic as well, saying Magic uh, Laysack. He's saying, thanks for that amazing experience, Roy. Lovely to listen to Scott. Absolutely, Scott. And time for a dram, Gregor. We both know Gregor, Gregor. very well. He's saying, Roy, uh, a, a tasting insight on the new rum tomato. The new, oh, yeah. So that's a, a new release. Um, for the Strathdown community, so uh, obviously the community is a big part of the, uh, the Tomatin story, and we have bottled a visitor centre exclusive uh, mm. 2009 single cask that is only available here or at the local shop or, or on our website, um, and it is a, a rum finish. And it's actually, some of you will remember that we did a 2009 rum edition a few years ago, bottled at 46%. This is a single cask version of that. Oh, okay. It's been allowed to mature a little bit longer. longer. Yeah. So we don't have a, of all the things that we've got on the desk here tonight, I think that's not one of them. Gregor is not a peat hound, but he does have a wee bit of a sweet tooth. Yeah. So I think that's why he's curious to ask about that one. Fantastic, Greg, uh, Magic and Gregor, thank you very much for your drams. Now, before we go on and hit this quiz, look at how late we are, but it was an inevitable thing. I knew it was going to be late, but it's a bit of a special V-pub. I will uh, catch up with timestamps and, and things for everybody tomorrow morning. Um, we're going to have the menu quiz, but there's one more that I've been... Uh, where's it gone? It's down where's, here. Uh, okay, it's been put out of, <laughs> put out of reach. Uh, there's a wee hand uh, written sticker on this. Yeah. And I mean, everything I've poured is going to be enjoyed tonight, but there's, there's quite a lot in front of me as well, if, especially if we include these new makes here. Um, but this one, I think if we talk about the history and the changing shape of tomato over time, we've got something here that may have come from a, a cask that's got a blue cap on it. I don't know if it would have no, such a thing. No, not one of those. Something a little bit different a year later. So I, I knew it was a year later, but it's um, it's only those four 1976 casks that have the blue caps. That's right. Okay, yeah, they're, the blue ends. Uh, I think there's other casks with blue ends, but they're the only ones that really count. Okay. Um, 
what we've got here is 1977. And the reason that I've got this bottle here is that this cask was used in decades. This yeah. is a bottle that was drawn from the cask that was used in decades too. So it's a component of that. It's 1977, fully matured in a refill hogshead. So this is an example of what happens when you don't mess about. You just put this is the question I've written down here. Look, what have I written here? Refill casks, please. <laughs> because, because it's something that's missing from a lot of core ranges. I think is, um, if I think back to one of the ones that the Whiskey Dev and I have enjoyed this very week is Anok, Nock Do's 16 year old that was discontinued. We're hoping it's going to make a reappearance again as well. But the idea that you get to teenage years, Graham, bring an empty glass up for some of this, please. Yeah. Um, you, you, um, you get this experience of the spirit that's been, as Scott says, it's not been allowed to be messed around with. It's just left in this refill cask, which back in the day would have just been called distillery wood yeah. because it's already been used. Yeah. And it's just left. And time does its thing. And it's a thing that Scotch whiskey is, it's not unique, but it's what it's always done very, very well. Because of the way it's made, with the view to maturing for a long time, because of the climate here, because of the fact that we don't use, typically we use refill casks in the majority of cases. So you end up with something that's unique and it's a wonder to behold. I'm already um, anticipating a, a wee, this is quite dark actually uh -huh. looking at it. Yeah, I think that's one thing straight off the bat. You know, when we think of refill casks, we often think of how light they are because we only really see them in their youth sometimes, you know? Um, but in the same way that if you put a sherry into a cask and allow it to oxidize, it gets darker, it, it gets browner. And that's what's gone on here with this 1977. So that is um, 42 years of maturation. The cask is half full. So that means there's 50% air in there, breaks down the alcohols, breaks down the acids. We all love smelling and nosing a whiskey and as we're sitting on our own or we're sharing or whatever it is we're sitting back and there are whiskies that you can nose and nose and nose and it's difficult to even it's almost like every every time you approach the glass you're building up the anticipation for a sip that's one of these whiskies it's super tropical it's like really quiet but forward fruit if that makes any sense it's everything if somebody tells you there's peach and apricot in here mm -hmm. fine yes if somebody tells you it's pineapple absolutely even melon aromatic melon like a gallia melon or a, something like that but it's the dunnage thing that we were talking about when scott was touring earlier it's here that fustiness that's somehow bizarre and yet absolutely appealing yeah you know it's... this is the type of whiskey sorry scott that you if somebody poured this for you blind you might not be able to decipher exactly what it is, but you know, you would know it's special. Yeah, I, th I think it's one of those things that you might not be able to say that it's a whiskey, but you wouldn't know what it was. You wouldn't be able to say, I think this is a rum, or I think this is a cut. It's a totally different thing up into itself. And what a privilege, Scott. Thank you so much. No Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. I look at a smile <laughs> on his face. <laughs> I think what I love about this as well is if we left a, a whiskey in a first full bourbon barrel for 42 years or a first full sherry cask for 42 years, it would be overcooked. It would be, it would be crispy, yeah. it would be dark. Oh my goodness. This is vibrant. It's, it dances around your palate, right? It's so fruity, so fruity. All that time in wood and yet the oak is it's absolutely in check. It's just lovely finish. Again, a wee bit minerally there. That's that's amazing. I get almost a, I often get in our older whiskies a herbal you note, know, a heathery, um, sometimes edging on mint. Yeah. Um, I've not even touched on how floral it is. Absolutely. Fantastic. I mean, just an, an absolutely epic example of what we love about mature Highland whiskey. Uh -huh. um, just amazing. I mean, far beyond the reach of mortals like us, <laughs> unless we have the ability to have a week where it's very difficult to sip, regularly sip this, yeah. this whiskey. However, enjoying all whiskey in whatever form it comes in all helps to enjoy these wee unique moments with something like this. Cheers to everyone. Thank you for Cheers. tuning in. Cheers. Let's see how the chap's doing, the chap's doing before we get the Revan and Menno in for his quiz at the end. 
absolutely fantastic stuff. I don't think I missed any chats coming in. There's Gregor saying, in 2015, I had a bottle of the Kubokan Bourbon Edition. It was the best of a tasting at that time. Fantastic. And it's, it's nice to have that different take where the, the PPM, the, the fennels, especially the fennels that make it into the bottle, as we've yeah. demonstrated tonight, is much more uh, in check. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the legendary whiskies that you hear about from the past, from the Glengarry's, the Brora's, you know, these the old Klein leashes from the 60s and 50s. The, these weren't all overtly peated. No. The peat was there. It was yeah. part of the makeup. But it wasn't, the, you know, the, the and we have to remember that the reason that they're so powerful PT whiskies today is because it's popular, but also it's used in small proportions to make up blends. Yeah. When you're looking at a single malt and you're trying to, everything is a blend. Unless it's a single cask, everything is blended. When you're looking at something like this, it's nice to take peat as a part of the picture rather than something that's saturating the whole image. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what Highland whiskies, when it's done well for me, do very well. Kubokin is going to mature very nicely, I think, Absolutely. especially you've been making it for 16 years now, I guess. 16 but, years, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think the way I always tell people about, you know, Kubokin, it's a lightly peated whiskey. And sometimes people shut down when they hear that. I always tell them the smoke is used here like the salt. It's the seasoning on the dish. It's not the main ingredient. Yep. It pulls other flavours together. Um, I think one question that did come in earlier on in Kubokin was... Uh, would we be releasing more of the Black Owl Brewery casks? Yes. Um, so what we've got, we've got Creation One, which is Black Owl Brewery, Imperial Stout and Moscatel casks. So that wonderful orange versus bitter. Uh, and Creation Two is Japanese shochu. Very dry, bitter whiskey. I have to yeah. say, if you like dry and you like bitter, that is very much that. Yeah. Yep, it's sorry. Got, we've got almost that umami yep. on the, the shochu and, and European virgin oak. Um, we do still have a handful of those Black Owl Brewery casks lying around. How we use them, what we do with them, no idea. Who knows? Um, but Creation 3 and 4 are coming out this year. They're really, really interesting. 3 is uh, Moroccan wine and rye casks, so that kind of fruity, spicy thing going on. And 4 is Tawny Port and Cognac casks. Do you know why I think this is interesting and a positive thing? Is because you're, the, the, the core range is in place and it's not going to be messed with. That's the core range. You're being able to use this kind of Creation's vehicle if you like to step away from the signature mm -hmm. and play and and maybe learn lessons from playing see what goes down well see what's well received what flavors actually add to the experience and what makes it just a nice distraction and add a yeah. variation to a theme yeah. and you're still keeping the core ranges intact yeah. so which is i think a, a good way of doing it rather than kind of switching backwards and forwards and being out of the way which of course is the way, the way we came to that is quite simply out with uh, signature we don't have enough of these other casks to create ongoing products. Of course, yeah. So rather than looking at that as a problem, we've looked at that as a great opportunity to be able to say, okay, every year you're going to look at all of the casks that we've got, every style, every parcel, and you're going to create the best whiskey possible from that. There's not going to be a worry about whether it's conventional or whether it's repeatable. The single goal is to take those casks and make two, one, however many it is, excellent and interesting whiskies. It's not um, mixing casks for the sake of mixing casks. It's flavor driven. We don't actually look at what cask type they are when we're looking at the samples. Yeah. Just mix them and it's then going on it flavor. afterwards. It's yeah. gone on flavor. Yeah. And it's, if anybody's interested in understanding a wee bit more about that and specifically an influence of casks, you might remember Graham Yunson joined the V-Pub if you just search, search for the magic of the cask, one of my favourite ever V-pubs that we did, Graham is just, he's just a gentleman and a great guy, super, super knowledgeable, highly respected in the industry. And this, what he shared with us that, that night should give everybody much, much more interest, uh, sorry, much more insight into the interesting side of what the, the cask effect on spirit. Scott, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've put a wee cover on this 1977 and put it off to the side yeah. so that when this is all off, I can just have a wee quiet moment <laughs> and just reflect. I might even sneak around the corner and tell you. Well needed. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Listen, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I appreciate just how late it is. Uh, you've all stayed with us right to the bitter end, and I'm very, very grateful to everybody. Um, please hang around with my friend over in Belgium, uh, Menno, who's been sitting in the background. I'm going to draw him in just now, and I'm going to uh, give him a... Th he's, he's good to come in. Menno, my friend, it looks like... I'll, no, it's okay, you can just about see me. I know that it must be very, very difficult for you to... I am going to, just as a thank you, I'm going to sneak something from here and put it into a wee sample bottle and bring you a wee treat if I can do it at all. Just to thank you for your patience sitting in the background. Uh, what no we're going to do... My pleasure. 
is I'm going to scooch up Menno. I'll just I'll pull me on full screen. If Graham, uh, sorry, the whiskey rev, pull up a seat, come alongside us here. I'll switch this back to there, and I'll turn, turn it like this, and the hope that it can get. So you'll need to sit in the middle here, Scott. And we'll need to do this for now. Excuse the noise. <laughs> we are in a mash tun. But, but come in, you're nowhere close. Come in, come in. Come in. It's because yeah. you the camera. There you go. I'll move the camera. <laughs> do you want me to move it? No, it's fine. It's fine. I can do it from here as a delay. Look at that. There we, go. there we go. So here is my friend Graham, the cameraman for tonight while we're doing a wee tour of the Whiskey Rev. And he's here purely to endure the fun of Menno's quiz tonight. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you all a wee ABC. What, what, what can we expect tonight, Menno? More of the same? Or have you. Uh, it's funny you should mention that because um, Scott's been a fantastic tour guide um, as ever, and I think he probably gave away about half of the questions tonight. <laughs> talking about tomatoes. Fantastic! So it is a tomato theme, then, is it? Absolutely, yeah. Do you know why I'm giving you these wee folded up pieces of paper? ABCs. It's the ABCs. Uh -huh. You've been here, oh, seen, been, seen it, done it. You're, yeah. you're wearing the, the badges and the scarves. I just hope I know the answers to the tomato questions. That would be embarrassing, <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, I, I mean, I should have been listening tonight for sure. Um, I get to go through the pain with everybody else for these uh, quiz at the end that Menno brings along. I think it's great. We all appreciate that you do it, Menno. So all we're going to do here, guys, is so that we're answering all together, is we're going to write an A and a B and a C on, and Menno's prompt will hold up at the same time what our answer is. I think we've only got one pen at the table, have we? Yeah, I think so. There you go. So you can this do me? Menno, I'll try and do the tech here, try and make this thing work. Usually there's lots of wee windows down the side where we're all dropping in, we can all be seen, mm -hmm. but we're all squished into yeah. one. Look at the ref. You have a pen. There's more in my bag too. Excellent. Who, who needs a pen when you've got uh, 20 great whiskies in front of you? Exactly. That's right. We can just we can just shout it. <laughs> I'll pull up this quiz, Meno. Your screen share. Fantastic. Hopefully we can okay. see that. It's good job. It's good. Cracking then. Good. We're good to go. Question one. Fifteen years ago, Tomatin had two official releases, according to the Malt Whiskey Yearbook of 2006. How many are available today, according to their website? And to be clear, those labeled as tomatin, so not the Kuboken ones, not the blends, just the tomatin ones. Is it A, 14, is it B, 21, or is it C, 30? That's quite incredible. And, and uh, you, I knew you'd be stumped at this, but that, it point, I think we pointed this out. So much of it now is available is malt for malt's sake. So it's gone from two. Uh, you give us, I'll try and pull up the chat here so we can uh, uh, interact with those guys too. You give us a countdown and we'll hold it up when we're ready. Okay, in three, two, one. What? What are what you doing? Got, got... What is that, ABC? ABC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying C, Scott B, the Rev A. I have a feeling where this is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, one of you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, 30 wow. C. So there's seven in the core range. There are 13 limited releases, four from the warehouse, six, five from travel retail, and the 50 year old. Fantastic. This table looks very barren now, all of a sudden, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 30. That's that's uh, uh Scott. Okay, yeah, I'll just give me score here because I'm feeling quite good now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my laughs> Acceleration is good this evening. Fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah, that surprises you a lot, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what is in my head is you know, we've got six or seven core range always available mm -hmm. i think what is amazing when you do have a look through the website and see some of the incredible whiskies we've released over the years as limited editions or things like that it's uh, it's qu quite jaw-dropping 
And I have to say that back in the day, there was a Tomatin 12 available in a narrow, skinny bottle, That's a right. Tomatin 15, and, an 18, yeah. and a Tomatin 18. Yeah, and it was, it was Graham. Do you remember which one that you used oh, to recommend? The 18. The 18, the Whiskey Wednesday, yeah. Magic. Yeah, and we, that was, I think that was what endeared us to Tomatin, was that bottle of that 18 year old. Um, quite amazing. Okay, buddy, carry on. Fantastic. Question two. In the 1970s, Tomatin was one of the biggest distilleries in Scotland. And after expanding their still house in 1974, they had a capacity of some 12 and a half million litres each year. How many stills did Tomatin have at that time, Scott? Was it A, 10, B, 15, or C, 23? So how many stills did Tomatin have in 1974? Oh, wow. Well, you know this one. You're confident all of a sudden. Yeah. I should have been listening because I know it was mentioned tonight. It was. Yeah. You guys ready to commit? Yes, I'm ready to commit. Okay. One, two, three. Let's have these answers. C. No, no, no. C. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cheer of relief. <laughs> From over it here. was C, 23 still. Okay, Scott Dog is actually saying 23 out loud, and look at that, the knowledgeable lounge, absolutely. James Morgan is saying C, wink, thanks, absolutely fantastic. Most of the knowledgeable whiskey folk in the lounge, lounge nailing it as always, fantastic. 23 well stills, odd number as I, well. I was worried about a banana skin there, and it might be the number at the start of 1974 no, no, rather no, no, than the no. end. I was... That will be 12, I think, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, the men would have put banana skin in. Yeah, there, there will be banana skins coming up. Don't you worry. <laughs> no doubt, no, no doubt. <laughs> okay, question three. In March this year, Tomatin released a series of whiskies that were all what? A, finished in French wine casks, B, at least 30 years old, or C, Asian market exclusives. Ooh. Again mentioned tonight. Well, I'm surprised. Is it, is it really March? Is this a banana skin? No banana skin. Okay. Mm. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. You guys ready? <laughs> yes. I think so. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> Go ahead in three, two, one. We are all saying A. Triple A. Triple A. Triple A. And of course, you're triple correct. It's the French connection collection. So Reeve Salt was one. Yeah. Cognac. Com Cognac's actually coming out in September. Oh, okay. um, so there was Reeve Salt, Montbaziac, and Sauterne. So with the three sweet wines, that's that lovely comparison, that tasting at home. And then the Cognac is an outlier within the set. There we go there. Yeah. Superb. Superb. Good, we're, we're strong. Then I just need another two favors from you, and I've hit the pass marker. I can relax. For the <laughs> okay. Question four tonight. You are coming live from a Meshten. Now, the Lauter Meshten gets its name from the German word Lautern, which means what? Oh. Is it A, to separate, B, to purify, or C, to stir? Hmm. Oh, and initially, this was the question about where the name uh, Tomatin came from and the juniper thing. And I had, it, had to change it because it was already the third or the fourth question Scott gave away. So I had to come up with one. We don't need to social distance anymore. We should mention that. Is that correct? I think yes. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> Lautern means what? Like Okay, I am I am having to guess. Me too. I am having to guess. Okay, answers so in to... one, two, three, if you please. Oh no. B and two B's and an A. Two B's and an A. I'm sorry, Roy. It is to purify. Oh, oh, How can it be to purify? My my only thinking there it was a total gamble, but I thought every mash ton stirs and every mash ton does the other word, but purify, that's the whole point of this. Is that clear work? Uh, I, however, yes. never doubted my knowledge for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, that draws it level, boys. We're, we're, we're all three for four after four. Fantastic, man. Oh, great question as magic, well. <laughs> okay. Question five is, as you know, always the picture question. Oh, there you see 
possible location for Tumatan? So the question is, where is Tumatan actually located? Is it A, B, or C? Oh. Well, I like this. <laughs> this is going to help people on is it a space side in the future too. <laughs> So what, what do we have? I just we just need to see that a wee bit better. Let me zoom in a wee bit on that one. A at the top, B in the middle to the right, and C just down a wee bit lower. Fantastic. It's a little bit like your sat nav tonight. I hope your wife knows what the answer to this question is, because if no, you're never getting picked up. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm going to be phoning my wife at something stupid like past one o'clock in the morning <laughs> to come and collect this. <laughs> wow. Anyway, I'm ready to go. Okay, answers in three, two, one. All bees, right? A lot of bees all humming yeah. like happy little bees, and of course you're if, absolutely I, If correct. any of us got that long, I think it would be a wee red face. <laughs> but, it's, but it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's right smack bang in the centre of Scotland, uh -huh. um, but not necessarily in the centre of... Well, it is in the centre of the Highlands. It's just that a big chunk of the Highlands is allocated yeah. to this space. Like, yeah. Um, how many miles to Inverness from here north? 15. 15 miles yeah. south of Inverness. What's really interesting is the original company was called the Tomatin Spay District Distillery Company. So Spay District. Back in the Victorian times, Spay was the big thing, you yes. know, Glenlivet. Yeah. Um, but over the years, it's Highland. Our water source is a tributary to the Fintorn rather than the Spay. So. Superb. Nice one, Meryl. Okay, question six it is then. Two tomatin based blends are Talisman and the Antiquary. Who take their name from where? Yes, good question. Very good question. A, are they poems by Robert Burns? Is it B, they're novels by Walter Scott? Or is it C, the nicknames of the two original stills? So mm -hmm. the Talisman and the Antiquary take their name from where? I see perplexed. Expressions. I was, I was hoping to look at you for <laughs> a little bit of guidance on it. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I, I kind of felt for a flicker of time there that it was an educated guess, but we have to go and see. Uh, I'm ready when you are. Scott's confident. Okay. In three, two, one, then. A lot of bees, I We're think. All bees. <laughs> that makes me feel a little bit better. And you're all correct. Jimmy Lake is shouting, does anyone know this? Well, Scott yep. knew it. Sir Walter Scott. Yeah, John and William Hardy, the two brothers that um, created the antiquary, their father used to live next door to Walter Scott um, oh, and brilliant. created a whiskey after his books. That's superb. Yeah. Okay, next question. The Koboken creation number two is matured in both European virgin oak cask and Japanese sochu casks. But sochu can be made from what? Can it be made from A, rice, barley, or brown sugar? Can it be made from carrots, potatoes, or chestnuts? Or can it be made C, all of the above? How can you make sochu? Mm. Do you know this? Weird noise coming from Roy. Yes. <laughs> Scott's confident. I'm guess uh, I'm guess I'm gonna go with it. Uh, I'm ready to go, Meno, anytime you are. Okay, then in three, two, one. I'm hoping it's but, all of the above. Scott thinks a. all of the above. The ref says A. Yeah. Who would make a carrot? It's very <laughs> Japanese and it can be made from all of the above. So pretty much anything goes when it comes to making sochu. I have a Japanese neighbor, Yumiko, and she was telling me about shochu. But in my head, I started to weave in sake mm -hmm. and get a wee bit confused. Eh, but I, I made it, hopefully. I was kind of listening, to Yumiko. Okay. Fantastic. And the, and the lounge, the, the, the barflies absolutely got that one too. They were all mostly CCCs. Fantastic. Okay, Meno, when you're ready. Yep. Question eight. So Tomatin was founded in 1897, which is quite remarkable, but why? Is it because A, it was the year of the Pattison crash? Is it B, along with Tomatin, no less than 11 other distilleries were opened? Or is it C, after several years of bad harvests, barley had become scarce or scarce?
At least Menno brings a tough gig, doesn't he? <clears throat> I am I'm committed here, but I'm fun. not confident. And there's a wee yellow banana skin there. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. Which means the answer we think it is. is... Yeah, the answer that we think might be wrong for it. Anyway. Okay, then show me the answers in three, two, one. I've got this one. We've got C. B. We've got a B in Scott, what? I can't make it up. Two Bs and an A. <laughs> Two Bs and a C. Okay. Well, I can tell you that none of you fell for the banana skin, which was the Patterson crash, because that was actually a year later. Yes. 19, uh, 19, 18, 1898. But there were 11 other distilleries that opened in 1897. Excellent. And I've listed them here. So Ben Rear, Dalwini, Glen Dullan, Glen Murray, Glen Tockers, Speyburn, Tobin, Tobitin, and Tamdu, and the now closed or demolished Kepper, Donich, Colburn, Glenesk, and Imperial were all opened. Wow. Good company. Strong company. Yeah, absolutely. 1897, what a vintage, what a year. Superb, you know, another good question. Let's see here, the dogs have no uncles on six. Hey, Ronald on six. Jimmy Jazz only on three tonight. Jimmy, oh my goodness. Did you not tune in early enough, my friend? It's good to have you here. Uh, Curtis Campbell on five. Uh, BMO is saying B is for banana. Could be that. that don't uh, don't be tempted to assume. Lindsay Holman is saying five. Peter Box on six. Greg's Whiskey Aid on six. And Whiskey Central on seven. Good to have you in. Sheila, good to have you in. Greg, good to have you in. Peter and Lindsay, too. Fantastic. Menno, when you're ready. Okay. Closing in now. The famous pagoda roofs we see on many distilleries, but perhaps not Tomatin, are the work of an architect responsible for building or designing quite a few distilleries. What's his name? It's going to be easy, right? Is it A, Charles Doy, B, John Johnston, or C, Alexander Edwards? This, I think, should be fairly easy. The famous Alexander Edward ventilator. Stop it in yeah, the first one. Right. Okay. I think you've given us yeah, a nice easy one to set us up for the ass hat at the end, man. I think that's ah. what you're doing here. <laughs> Tell you what, bonus, bonus points be. for whoever knows what C and Charles C. Doig stands for. Okay. I don't need anyone. Cree. <laughs> Charles Cree, C R W Doig. <clears throat> a. A, 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 a lot of A's. And a. The lounge is Part literally two. screaming A. Yep. Absolutely, Charles Doig. Superb. Which brings me nicely to the final question, which in good Well, let's put more evil that we emoji there. Let's see how the scores are doing. Oh, yeah. Sugar Kitty is saying the last one is going to be horrid after this one. <laughs> Fantastic. Seven for Hell's Wit. Oh, Helen slipped to me, but she's usually super, super strong. Snapper XV on eight. Fantastic. Lassif Feet Oatsman. I don't, know, I don't know how to pronounce it the second, but Lassie, my friend, I'm sorry. Uh, but Andrew Butler is in for a 10 out of 10, I think. A, is there any 9 out of 9? Can anybody yep. see anything? Andrew nine? Butler is in for Andrew a 10. Andrew Butler, of course. One of our seasoned journeymen, Andrew. Fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, following up on the previous question, how many distilleries are accredited to Charles oh. Doyle? Oh. <laughs> because we're not talking about how many distilleries have pagoda ventilators. We're talking about how many distilleries have Pagoda ventilators accredited to Charles Cree Doig. Is that correct? A, yep, Should as much as, our, as there were distilleries that opened in 1897. Oh. B, about as much as there are in Speyside today, or C, about as much as there are on Isla and the Islands today. Oh, this is, a, this is the purest of the brutalist asshat, absolutely. <laughs> this is just a throw a dart, isn't it? That is a great question. I don't know what's more difficult, the questions or the questions that are in the answers. <laughs> right. I have, I have, I am ready to commit to you. Um, We're all ready to commit. Can I say what our scores are going in? Uh, Graham's are one, two, three, four, five, four, five, five six. six. Okay. One, two, okay, three, then four, five, three. Six, seven for Scott. 
Okay. Okay. Sorry. Go. Okay. Three, two, one. Was C. that C? C. What have you said, Scott? C. Also, we all, we all think it's about the same as there are on Isla and the islands. Well, I have to give it to Shayla, who commented quite accurately in the chat. It's 56 distilleries. Wow. So as much as there are in space side. Oh my. Oh wow. That's incredible. That is Indeed. incredible. And that right there is the purpose of the oh, I question nine I never got. That. Did we all get it right on number nine? Um, uh, well done, Andrew we Butler. Long number 10. <clears throat> Did he not take a day off? Eh? Did he not take a day <laughs> off? <laughs> Charlie Boy. Hi. That's right, he's a busy boy. Mero, fantastic. I don't feel as brutalized as I normally do. I'm feeling, I think that might be the best score on the Mero Quiz I've ever had. Is that 8 out of 10 for me? I think that beats my 7 out of 10 best ever Mero score. So I'm very pleased about that. ONG is saying, as hat got me. Let's see if Andrew Butler managed to secure his 10 out of 10 tonight. Whiskey Central Shayla on 9 out of 10. She's such well a done. student. She really is a student. Yeah, fantastic, Shayla. Well done. 6 out of 10, Steve Atkiss. Uh, he was rich then. Um, well, I don't know if he was. 7 out of 10 for... On a Meno quiz says precarious Dave, quite happy. Snapper XP is saying 8 out of 10. Well done, Andrew. Thanks, Meno. Superb in 6 out of 10. He's Thomas Elmer sticking his tongue out, but it's still a clean pass mark. Thomas, don't worry about it at all. Donald Pass Whiskey, 4 out of 10. Shot down in flames. <laughs> You've been Menoed. Hey, Tim, <laughs> You've been Menoed, absolutely. Let's see, where's Andrew? I'm, 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 I'm looking at There we go. I'm looking at Steve A. Meno quizzes. He must have, did he get it? 10 out of 10, yeah. Andrew Butler, know, it's, it's, let's raise a wee glass to the journeyman who's been drinking and enjoying whiskey since the year <laughs> this was distilled, 1977. Fantastic. Andrew Swan. Butler, on your 10 out of 10 and anybody else that scored highly or did well in Menos Quiz or just simply enjoyed it. Thank you to you all. Cheers. Well done, Cheers. Andrew. Cheers. Cheers. Wonderful stuff. Menno, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. If you can, and I know we appreciate you, maybe can't, Stay until the credits roll as well, and we can have a wee chat with you offline. Yep, Meno, sure. it's wonderful. Thank you all for your support over the V-Pubs in the weeks and coming in to do these occasional quizzes. I look forward to them, and I know a lot of other people do too. And I know your skin is thick enough to take all <laughs> the abuse that you may sometimes <laughs> have to deal with for it, but it's appreciated, my friend. Meno, thank you so much. Cheers to you. Thanks, Meno. Cheers. 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 Stay back. Night. Amazing. So there we go. I think we can wrap things up. We are only approaching three hours. It's amazing. That's quite a, bit, a quick tour. That's a short tour. It's <laughs> a quick tour. If you come here in person, it'll take a lot longer. <laughs> I, I hope it's helped everybody see the function that distillery tours can provide. It gives you a deeper understanding at every point of what's in the glass in front of you. But more than that, especially if this can go and it'll be allowed in some other places in the future, <laughs> Every distillery has a different take, a different lick on things. And it's difficult for me to imagine a distillery, if I imagine something that was functional like Loch Lomond, yeah. doesn't have the history of Tamara, right. it's a much newer thing. So if you imagine something that's from 1897, yeah. like some of the ones that, that, that these, these are much more kind of dry stone buildings and, and very, very, uh, Tamara is difficult to find an easy comparator, right? Uh -huh. it's, it is a very, very unique thing. I think it's the alive nature of it, isn't it? It always grows, it always moves with the time, it changes. The sense it. that you're not coming to a museum or a visitor centre, you're actually being allowed to walk around yeah. a fully functioning distillery that barely gives a nod to the fact that there are people coming to visit. Yeah. It's where you <laughs> actually feel like, wow, it's amazing that I'm allowed to see these things. Uh -huh. Some of the doors that you have to walk through Aye. are so old and so low yeah. that really if you're 5, 10, 5, 11 or oh, taller, yeah. you need to be careful. And yeah. it's all of that kind of wrapped into one fairly expansive site yeah. that makes it really quite unique. Cool. I hope that everybody that's tuned in today has enjoyed a very, very different take on the VPUB. I've very much enjoyed it as well. Thanks so much to my friend Graham the Whiskey Rev for coming along and supporting tonight, really carrying all the heavy bags nice. of stuff and going around with the camera as well. Thanks to Scott for being an amazing host and not only just an amazing host, but an amazing driver of concepts and a visionary and somebody that can see beyond the very old traditional mindsets that sometimes exist in old traditional distilleries. Sorry, somebody's bought me a dram. I hope I'm not missing anything. I've had a couple brought in. That's uh, Juice Jones. Good to have you in, my friend. He's saying a dram for you. Just sitting here in a mash tun, like no business. 
Ben, my first to Matt and Sue, and cheers. Thank you very much. It's good to have you in, and thank you for your virtual jam. Juice Jones. Jim and Leg has bought me a dram as well to say three great men and whiskey. We really couldn't go wrong. Thanks, fellas. We're four great men, Jimmy. You're in there too. Thank you very, very much. In fact, just so many of you and joining tonight. Jimmy Leg and Juice Jones, thank you for your virtual drums. In the meantime, there's one more before the summer break. Next week, we're going to be doing Scotch versus the world. I wonder if it's going to be a tomato that's representing the Scotch. You need to tune in and see next week. It's the last week before the summer shutdown. I'll be back in the usual studio and I hope to welcome you there. Thank you so much for sitting with us throughout tonight. I know it's been a long time, but I'm always very, very grateful for the support. Thank you all, and I look forward to welcoming you next week. Let's raise a wee glass, gentlemen. Cheers. Wonderful stuff. Slancha, man. You're all very dearly loved next week. Slancha. <laughs>